Right, I would like to call up the girls basketball team from West Campus High School to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. The California champion West Campus High School girls team. the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I Mr. Minnick. All right. Thank you for being here. I am very excited to be able to uh, speak about, about you all tonight. Um, the West Campus girls basketball team has demonstrated ambition and unity as they powered through their winter season. Together they have shown themselves as well as those around them that dedication and perseverance serve as a platform for success. Under the leadership of their coach, John Langston, the support of their families, the encouragement of their campus, the girls' basketball team won their league in the CIF SAC Joaquin Division IV sections, and they are this year's California State Champions. <laughs> right, these, these young leaders are role models to all young women in our community, and it is with honor that we celebrate and recognize the California State Champion 2016-2017 Girls Basketball West Campus Warriors. <laughs> I just want to say, too, that I was at your... Um, Last uh, game on, on campus, which was amazing, and then to watch you play at Golden One Arena and uh, watch you just kick butt. Uh, <laughs> i got to watch what I say. Um, it was amazing. Uh, you guys, the, your ability to work together as a team was incredible, and I, I was so blown away by that. So congratulations, and I'm going to come down with a, a plaque for you all. Would you like to uh, say a few words? Pick one of your, all your team leaders can step forward. Come on up. Okay. Oh, it moves. Yes. Actually, yes, <laughs> okay. Um, we would like to give thanks to our coaches who have pushed us beyond our limits and our parents who have been there since day one and everybody who supported us throughout this journey. Thank you. All right. First, I'd like to give honor to God for what he allowed us to accomplish this year. And, and thank you guys for, um, re and for representing us and honoring us today. Um, I really appreciate it. They really appreciate it. And I don't have many worries because she said this is going to be a novel today. But thank you so much for honoring these girls. They really deserve it. Thanks so much. Thing. 
That Natalie, you wanna Okay. All right, we'll move to item five point oh actions taken in closed session. Yes, uh, Mr. President, I have one announcement and the superintendent has two announcements. My announcement is by a unanimous 7 to 0 vote. The board adopted resolution 2016-17-F, a resolution approving notice of intent to dismiss and statement of charges of certificated employee. That concludes my announcement, Mr. President. Thank you. President Hansen, I'm very pleased to announce that the board by unanimous vote approved the appointment of Troy Holding as principal of Theodore Judah Elementary School. Uh, he comes to us as, a, as, as being a principal for three years, the past three years in Twin Rivers. And just want to highlight some of the things that said about him, that he has, he's a strong instructional leader, great content knowledge, has extensive experience in positive behavior intervention strategies, PBIS, and has excellent rapport with staff and students. Um, so with that, I think let's give him a round of applause. I'm also happy to report that uh, the board, by unanimous vote, approved the appointment of Chase Tafoya as principal of Woodbine Elementary School. Uh, Chase has been a, an, an assistant principal in our district for a number of years at Elder Creek, John Still, and at Wilsey Wood. Uh, some of the things said about Chase is uh, his transparency, his work ethics, student-centered. He models high expectations and great work ethics and is always available to meet with students, staff, and parents. We expect uh, great things from him as well. Another round of applause. Okay. Well, uh, we have a slight proposed change on the agenda adoption to move item 12.3, uh, the technology update, update to item 12.1, and move everything else down. Uh, with that, I'd like a motion to approve the agenda. Um, point of clarification, could you repeat that? Yes. I move item 12.3, the technology update, up to 12.1, and okay. then everything else just flow from there. Uh, Mr. President? Yes. I would also like to uh, move to defer item 12.2 regarding the New Tech High School Charter Petition to the next board meeting on April 20th to allow for further study by staff. Okay. Second. Okay. With those two revisements to the agenda, do I, I have a, a motion and a second? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Thank you very much. We have an agenda. Now we will go to item 7.0, special presentation. More West Campus. Let me turn it over to uh, Mr. Minnick. Hey, let me put this back up. <laughs> <clears throat> getting a lot of use out of that sure all right well again I am excited to talk about West Campus with dignity leadership and a unified front the West Campus boys soccer team won the division 5 CIF SAC Joaquin section championships on March 2nd 2017 we would like to recognize the boys in their continued pursuit of greatness with the guidance of their coach Ben Zook the support of their families and the encouragement of their campus, the boys' soccer team thrived this season. As leaders on the campus and on the field, the boys' soccer team has much to be proud of. We are honored to have such motivated and inspiring young men within our district. So I'd like to bring forward the West Campus Warriors boys' soccer team.
And I will once again come down with a plaque for your team. If anyone would like to say some words, now is your chance. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank uh, Dadrian. He's a he's yeah. And uh, we had a question. So do we get pizza after this? <laughs> it's on your board number. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'd be happy to provide that for you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I just want to say that it's been an honor and a privilege to be playing with such an amazing group of guys um, and just being able to go this far to win a section title. And uh, I mean, this is something that every high schooler dreams of doing. And to have been able to do this my senior year is just an incredible blessing. And uh, it's something I could be able to talk, I'd be able to talk about for years and years down the road. Um, so yeah, I just want to thank my team because they really poured out their heart into this and, uh, it really paid off. And, uh, I also want to thank my coaches and as well as my principal, uh, for just backing the team and really believing in us. And, uh, ultimately I want to thank God for just giving me the ability to play and, uh, for allowing me to have this incredible experience. So thank you. Thank you very much. I always know where to look. Congratulations again. Uh, I'd like to call on board member Rosas. Thank you. This meeting of the Sacramento City School Board is being recorded in its entirety and will be cable cast on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T UVerse. Today's meeting will air Sunday, April 9th at 9 a.m., Monday, April 10th at 6 p.m., and webcast at Sacramento. Um, sacmetrocable.tv. We welcome members of the audience to address the board. Please fill out a speaker form located in the back of the community room and give and fill it out. Fill out the speaker form um, and please, when you're finished, give them to our communications representative prior to the conclusion of the items presented. Please speak into the microphone when addressing the board and state your name for the record. Please limit comments during public comment to items that are not on the agenda. If you do speak on an item that is on the agenda, we will ask that you please defer your comment until your item comes up on the agenda. Also, please turn off your cell phones or place them on silent or vibrate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before we move to public comment, I'd just like to welcome all the folks that are here to join us for the meeting this evening. It's very much appreciated. And I know a lot of people are here to discuss uh, one of our items that's on the consent calendar. Um, I understand we'll be taking that item off the consent calendar to allow folks to make uh, discussions on that. So if you're here to talk about the field allocations, if you want to wait till the consent calendar, which is just a couple minutes away, then there'll be an opportunity to discuss that. Um, and with that, I will go to Mr. Barrios, public comment. We have uh, five... Six public comments. If you could come up in order, please. Darlene Anderson, Bernie Church, Robert Ricci, Mark Epstein, Howard Mahoney, 
and Mandy Carrillo. Good evening, board members. Darlene Anderson here. I've been gone for a minute, but I haven't really been gone because I've been participating in other ways. And what I have found is that there's really no way to participate or advocate for African-American children in this district. I have been at Kennedy for the last two years working with a student who has 25 credits. He was in special ed. Did special ed create a safety net? No. We finally got the IEE completed. There is no program for him there. I am very sad that in our high schools, when we talk about students who are not achieving, that we have not used the administration here to support the schools and what that looks like. Because I don't believe a lot of people don't know what it looks like. The services at the high schools are not what they used to be. A push-in model for special ed for a student who has disabilities is no model at all. I try to work with my community so that they understand the public option of a public education should be a promise from the school district. So after 12 years, you can work, not go on the street and sell your body because prostitution is an issue in Sacramento. I don't know what else to do anymore. I have been coming since the year 2000. And it seems that when I come, I offend people. But when children are going to school for 12 years and they come out and they cannot sustain themselves, it is an issue with the district attorney in Sacramento that we have too much crime, death, and, pop and prostitution. So how is it that we don't choose not to micromanage our administration here in Sacramento City Unified School District and we have a data dashboard that continues to increase in student behavior. Well, I don't know how you expect a, st an eight, a student in the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade to behave or come every day when they are failing and at the third and fifth grade level of reading. And high school does not prevent, it does not present to students remedial support. So there is no remedial support. When a student gets to Kennedy and they're not at grade level, they are going to fail for four years, but they're expected to attend. And this board has a responsibility to offer the faith to all children, not just some. And thank you. Thank you. Bernie Church. I have one page. I hope I can read it in time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board, Thank you for listening to us this evening. My name is Bernie Church, and I'm here to support the students, parents, and faculty of McClatchy High School. My background is that I was affiliated with McClatchy High as a teacher, coach, and department chairperson in my 36 years at the school. Forgive me for having to read my thoughts, but I get too emotional and lose my focus because it seems that once again, McClatchy High School will not get the funds needed to bring it up to the standards of the other five comprehensive high schools. My uncle started teaching at McClatchy the second year after it was built, which was 1938. I joined him on the staff in 1968. I do know the history of the school and how it has been shortchanged over the decades in the upgrades of its facilities. For some reason, McClatchy has always been last in getting help for its facilities. We are now the oldest school in the district. That being the case, you should know that we were the last school to get tennis courts and a swimming pool. Now we are lumped in with other high schools for possible funding for athletic fields improvements. It boggles my mind that any other school should even be considered until McClatchy is, at least, brought up to the standards now enjoyed by the other high schools. It seems only logical that the oldest school in the district should be first in line to receive any and all money this year and in the future years to improve their outdoor facilities until their facilities, at least, match the minimum standards of the other high schools. I realize this board is not responsible for the past decisions of past boards. However, I think it is incumbent of this board to now dedicate itself and all of its financial resources to make sure McClatchy High School has at least the outdoor facilities of the other high schools. The other high schools in the district were built 21, 25, 30, and 68 years after McClatchy High School. These schools have stadiums, bleachers, astroturf fields, and lights. McClatchy has none of this. 
Why the discrepancy? McClatchy High School and community deserves better than what they have received over the years. It is now time for this board to make things right for McClatchy High School. No money this year or in the future years should be allocated to any other high school for repairs, maintenance, and or upgrades for any athletic field improvements that the McClatchy facilities are at least brought up to the standards of the other high schools in the district. Here's hoping this board has more common sense than the previous boards who have neglected McClatchy High School over the last 80 years. Please feel free to call me on as a resource and thank you for your attention to this matter. Thank you. Robert Ritchie. Ladies and gentlemen of the school board, thank you for listening to me. I'm an alumni from C.K. McClatchy High School from 1959, and I now give all my time to the boys' golf team. I cannot express any more eloquently than my previous speaker. I agree with him wholeheartedly. We need to do something in relationship to McClatchy High School Hiram Johnson High School. There are other schools that need work. McClatchy does need it the most. I would appreciate you giving us as much as you can. We are going to be here, and we're going to continue to fight until we do get this done. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Epstein. Good evening, Mark Epstein, Director of the California Environmental Technology Education Network. Here to follow up on my uh, presentation announcement a couple months ago is dealing with the web map, the story map structured exercises. I believe at that time I did mention that I was aware of a generalized mention of, um, of geospatial technology in the newly uh, adopted C3 social studies framework st uh, standards. Uh, last week, I had an opportunity to go through those standards in detail and realize and saw that there was more than just a generalized statement, but some very specific um, standards, which the paper that I passed out from you is the page from that document and I have outlined in red those standards that are specific to geospatial technology, and then in the blue that I outlined are those standards which in today's world are best accomplished of fulfilling through the um, current and recently available web mapping um, applications. The high school standards there are very important and with this district, um, you have an opportunity to get ahead of the curve with this district at its high schools having its semester geography class. And I want to add to um, what I announced with our structured story map exercises, we also have a web mapping mini course that would fulfill that standards. And to my knowledge, I believe that we've got the only type instructional materials that are designed to, um, if you want to say, speak to secondary students. So I thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Howard Mahoney. Not here. Howard Mahoney. That's okay. Members of the board, um, my name's, sorry again, it's been a long time since I've been here. My name's Howard Mahoney, I'm the founding principal of Sacramento New Tech High School, and I stayed because of two reasons. One, I'm very thrilled that you decided to give this further study, um, and two, because I've had some family situations I may not be able to come in two weeks. Um, I was really disturbed when I heard the recommendation. I understand the issues of charter renewal and deciding whether a charter should be renewed, but I was very disturbed. There are others who speak to the impact the school's out on the lives next week or the next board meeting. I want to talk about the central issue, 
why I believe the school is not doing well and why I think it's a good idea to take an action that will keep the school open in some way, shape, or form. I personally believe that if you take the charter away from New Tech, it will end, either because you have to close it because it's just not financially possible or because it will be modified so much it will not be in New Tech. You might as well change it back to Thurgood Marshall High School, which is the previous day. Um, what I'm about to say may not be well received, especially by some of your staff. But stated with respect for the district and the challenges that the district and the school have faced over many, many years. A key aspect of the new deck model is a protocol called critical friends. I'm here as a critical friend. I do respect the district. I do know the difficult decisions you face. But I think there's been some things that have gone on that just are not acceptable. I'm also winging it a little bit because of the decision. Um, this model is by far the most widely replicated, innovative, and successful high school reform model in the world. I didn't write the numbers down because I didn't think I'd have time, but it's got over 4,400 teachers, 72,000 students, 46 high schools, 36 middle schools, 23 elementary schools. Napa Valley Unified is doing this whole model throughout their entire school system. It can be supported by a standard district. They are not that different a district in Sac City. Sorry, lost my time. Um, I can urge you to talk to Napa Valley Unified. I urge you to talk to the New Tech Network and consider what you may do to set the course of New Tech High straight. I know it's not performed well, but it can be a great school. Thank you very much. Mandy Carrillo. Good evening, uh, Honorable Board President, Superintendent, members of the board, district staff. Um, my name is Mandy Carrillo, and I'm a New Tech alum. I am also a Sac City board member alum. I was student board member 0506, um, and I'm a graduate of UC Santa Cruz. And I realized New Tech was taken off the agenda this week, and I'm appreciative of that, because I really think that if you take the time in the next two weeks to speak with alumni, to speak with family alumni, to speak with the staff present and past, I think that you will really see the benefit that New Tech has to offer, not just the students that currently go there, but the future students that will be able to go there, and students past who have already graduated and continue to come back and continue to be a family. And I think when you remove a school and remove that physical structure, it really hinders, um, hinders the growth, the potentiality even in the future for students like me that are alumni. I will be reaching out to you over the next two weeks, and I know fellow alumni and my fellow classmates will be reaching out, and um, we really urge you to get the big picture and not just listen to the handful of opinions that maybe come from people that do not have experience with the school itself, um, that have not had the experience of the project-based learning environment and the computers and the technology environment within that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Carolyn Dalton. Good evening, board. My name is Sherilyn Dalton. I've been here once before. All I'm asking is my son broke his arm at school. I've called the district about the incident report, or can I get some kind of report? What happened? Nobody has contacted me yet. I spoke to a young lady named Asia. She was supposed to have her head office call me. I have not still received anything. On May 16th, I put in for assessments for my son with Miss Bryant. I still haven't heard anything from her or from the district. Now, we're getting ready to go into spring break next week. Your time would have lapsed that you guys have not, or this school has not gotten back in touch with me about my son's assessments. They want to say he's this, and they want to say he's that. Well, let's prove it and let's get these assessments done. 
Now, I've been asking for assessments for my son since the third grade. I've been bamboozled, everything shoved under the rug. Now he's in sixth grade, it's time to get some action done. I've been in this school district too long to see too much, and nobody's getting robbed right now but my son. And I'm here to fight for him. And so I want it done. And just like with the next parent that's coming up here now with Pony Express, I am so appalled that this is still going on after a year. I'm gone out of the school. Now I'm working with other parents that are in that school. And I cannot believe that this stuff is still going on at Pony Express. And I want it to stop. I'm, I'm seeking counsel right now because I feel that Caleb's been robbed. And he's, he's not to get robbed no more. I've had enough. We've had enough. Thank you. I'll have someone uh, get your information and make sure we get back to you. Kira Phillips. Um, yes, board member Pritchett. Me one second. Go ahead. Can I request that we have an area superintendent in the back speak to these two parents before they leave the building tonight? Yeah. Thank We're you. We're doing that. Okay. Um, my daughter's been attending Pony Express for uh, five years now, and I went to go get a copy of her cumulative record, and for some reason, mysteriously, her first and second grade year is missing. I asked what happened, and somebody replied to me in an attitude, well, um, I don't know. If I have a problem, fix it with the principal. This in the past, there's been no problems that I can fix in the prince with the principal. The second grade year, I found, filed a, uh, a complaint against one of the office managers, Carol, and I have yet to seek a copy of that report. I've went to Mr. Jenks Henson's office several times over a month now and have not got a copy of that report. I wanted to know what was uh, basically proof that I filed the report. Also. Um, when I filed that complaint, the abundsman at that time told me to remove my daughter from that school if I have a problem with this woman. So that's what I did. I went all the way to Georgia to make sure that my daughter did not have um, involvement with one particular kid and as well um, uh, just to seek the same... Uh, I don't want to say uh, the negative treatment that I've got from the school, but anyways... Um, also, um, when I returned back to the school, her fourth grade year, unfortunately, I had to leave Georgia, came back. Um, I had the call, police called on me several times for no reason at all. Come to find out, this isn't the school police. And I'm kind of curious to how they got my home address. The address that I use on home, at my home is not the same address that I at the school has. So there has been some kind of mistreatment there where my records were passed on to the police. Also... Um, I would like to, um, lost it. and, uh, the traffic guards approach is very, uh, aggressive and I would like for somebody to do something because the way he approaches people is very unprofessional when he disagrees with them. Thank you for coming and, uh, got someone to get your information over there. One of our staff folks. And the public comment. Thank you very much. Uh, next item, 9.0, public hearing. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Wu. I just wanted to explain for um, uh, people who came out on behalf of New Tech that um, if you saw in the paper today, I was very interested in making sure that we do everything we can to make sure that we can make uh, save this school. And, I, and by asking for... Um, uh, asking for a postponement on this item, uh, we wouldn't then have necessarily have staff's recommendation to close before us. So this will give us give us a couple of weeks to um, work with staff and work with the community to possibly to come up with a possible solution that will allow us to uh, keep the school open. No guarantees, but at least we have a breather right now. So I thought it was necessary to explain that. Thank you. Item 9.0, Mr. Castillo. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, President Hansen, members of the board, and Superintendent Banda. The purpose of this public hearing and presentation is to request your approval for the waiver of for non-classroom-based funding determination for the May Charter School. The MED is a dependent charter school with nine to 12 grade students that has been in operation in Sacramento City Unified School District since 2003 or four. The educational model is our independent study where students perform work two days a week as part of the education experience. And then this model, the MED is required to apply for non-classroom based funding determination every five years the application submitted for years 2016-17 to 2020-22 was not accepted by the California Department of Education Charter School Division as it was required to be submitted prior to the start of the school year. A waiver is needed to obtain funding for 2016-17. California Education Code Section 47612.5 and 4763.5 4.2, as well as Title V, establish the criteria for the review and evaluation of the termination of funding requests for non-classroom-based charter schools. The statute specifies the charter school may receive a portion of funding for non-classroom-based instruction only if the termination of funding is made by the State Board of Education. Again, our request is for you to approve this recommendation. The staff needs your approval to complete a waiver online. The staff work very close with Mr. Wolf, principal of the MED, to make this recommendation, and we discuss the process. So the application for no classroom based determination is submitted every five years on a timely basis. Uh, thank you for listening. We are available to answer any questions. Okay. Do we have any questions or comments from the board? All right. Seeing none, do I have a motion to move this from conference to action? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? It's now an action item. Uh, to have a motion to second. motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. I'd like to recognize a facilities chair Pritchett uh, on yeah, the I consent think. agenda item. Thank you, President Hanson. I'd like to pull item 10.1 I. Very well. We can have Mr. Dobson up here for oh, yeah, an let me, Let's move the rest of the agenda. That Do I have a motion to move the remainder of the consent agenda? So moved. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Abstain? Uh, opposed? Thank you very much. The rest of the consent agenda is passed. Now we'll have uh, Mr. Dobson join us for... Item 10.1i, approve $10 million allocation for athletic field improvements. Good evening. Good evening. Just, uh, I don't know if you want to do a quick overview, yeah, just... just yeah, just to give us a, maybe a, a minute overview of this item, and then we can open it up for public comment. Sure. So the request tonight uh, before you is to allocate $10 million to the five, excuse me, comprehensive high schools listed uh, to address athletic field improvements at those sites. Um, if the board was to make that allocation, then the facilities department would begin working with the school sites, uh, identifying their needs, working with various uh, surveyors in some case, depending upon uh, what the desire is, was of the school, whether it was a track, field, other types of improvements. Um, that's the, the money is actually coming from, uh, is able to be sold early because of the assessed value, increased assessed value of our homes in the district. So this is really future money that had not been allocated that because of the increased in assessed value that we now have available to us to address some of these needs. Very good. Thank you. Do we have any public comment? One or two, maybe. Uh, we've got one, two, years. three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty. We've got 16 public comments. Perfect. Well, I look forward to hearing from the public, as we always okay. do. <laughs> <laughs> cool. 
<laughs> we'll start with Alejandro David Fimbres. If you could come up one by one as you're called. Hello, my name is Alejandro Fimbres, and I'm a Harm Johnson's freshman student. And for the short period of time that I've been here, I'm involved in a lot of athletic activities such as cross country, okay. soccer, baseball, and that's it. But um, I, I remember being in middle school and seeing my brother as a high school student in Hiram Johnson and them having home games and the relationships they've had between their teams and the confidence. And since this year, our fields have been deemed unplayable because of all the gopher field, all the gopher holes and everything. And the players have no confidence in themselves anymore. And it's just, it's sad to see because I remember back when I was in seventh grade and my brother and his friends were just, they were so excited to be a part of something together. And I don't see that for with the, with the teams this year. And it's, it just, it, it sucks. And, and um, it, even the football team, we, we had to rent out one day of lights for their homecoming game. And it's, they were very excited about that, but it's sad that they, they don't even have Friday night games anymore because they can't, we can't afford to buy lights. And thank you for hearing. Thank you. Cheyenne Camargo, followed by Ponce Savala. Hello. Hello, my name is Cheyenne Camargo. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you guys for um, finding the money to donate to the schools. And um, I've come up here to present my concerns about our school. We've, um, we've reached out with the posters, and I know you guys have heard us, which I really appreciate. We really want to be heard. We want to change the stigma around Johnson. Social media, all we ever hear is, you know, Johnson's ghetto. And we have such a bad reputation, but the reason that some of us act the way we do not me, but like <laughs> other people, is because they don't have um, the school spirit. Like our environment is really bad and we'd like to feel better about ourselves by improving our environment. That's why we want the better fields. That's why we want um, the better, the better um, structure at school. We believe that like going out there and not being able to run on our fields or running on our track and falling and getting rocks stuck in our knee, we think that's like the reason we can't excel. We have, um, there's various problems we have at Johnson. There's self-confidence issues. There's just um, things that affect us academically. And it's not just about how our teachers are. It's about how our campus makes us feel. And we'd appreciate it if you guys would um, reach out to us and try to help us in some type of way to get our school fixed. Thank you. Ponce Savala. Hi to, <clears throat> excuse me, hi to, uh, all of you guys, um, I have. You got been... to tell us your name. Oh, oh, I'm Ponce Zavala, and I also go to uh, Hiram W. Johnson High School. And I'm only a freshman, but while the time I've been at Johnson, I've done a lot of activities uh, that um, deal with the school. I've been involved in a lot of good things with this school. And um, I, I want, well, I, well, we all would like um, our fields to be um, fixed and like we all need improvements because students are getting hurt over the gopher holes that are in our football fields, our soccer fields. And um, we also uh, 
are just, um, I'm pretty sure um, we're all thankful for um, you guys uh, being here, letting us speak to you guys about this situation. And um, we just don't want any more injuries on the field just because it's over something that um, that's so small but yet so big. And um, just thank you. Thank you very much. Ginger Harris followed by Jenny Padilla. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ginger Harris, and I'm currently a junior at McClatchy High School. Uh, I'm here in support of funding for McClatchy, the, McClatchy's athletic fields. During my three years at McClatchy, I've played both on the soccer team and the tennis team. My freshman year on the soccer team, we played home games on our back football field. Uh, the field conditions were quite poor, but we managed. We played on. Uh, my sophomore year, the field was deemed unplayable and we played all our home games at a nearby park. And this past winter, our home field was back at McClatchy. However, we had a total of two or three home games. Uh, basically, the fields at McClatchy are in great need of renovation. Not only are the fields in poor shape, they have posed injury hazards, caused our soccer team to miss additional class time to travel, and simply, we haven't had the support of our peers that would traditionally come with a home game. As I hope you can see by the attendance of the McClatchy community here tonight, athletics holds a deep importance on our campus. We have continually performed well at the metro section and state level as a school. I realize McClatchy has received funding in other areas for other areas of the campus, but the issue of athletic facilities has gone long unaddressed. And I'm here to urge you to make this project a priority on behalf of not only the students at McClatchy, but the whole community and support system that has worked tirelessly on our end to make these improvements happen. Lastly, I want to thank you for representing our school in this crucial process. And again, thank you for your time. Thank you. Jenny Padilla, followed by Christina Pinales. Okay, so my name is Jenny Padilla. I humbly come forth today as a concerned future educator. My name is Jenny Padilla, student teacher at Hiram Johnson High School. I'm here talking on my behalf, myself, my students, and the Hiram Johnson student body, whom want to raise awareness for a matter that has been long overlooked. Hiram Johnson has no, no football field and no soccer field and no softball field and has been asking for a safe field year after year after year with no results. Other schools have access to neighbor fields, but we do not. According to studies by Resnick 1997 and Baymeister Leary and Leary 1995, connectedness and belongingness builds a sense of community that foster positive outcomes throughout a school day. Studies show that the school environments that our students are in has the ability to promote and foster education. And yet, I'm coming to a school where students feel that their voices are not being heard which can only hinder our common goal towards our students becoming college and career ready. These students have extreme want to have school spirit, which is one of the most fundamental aspects of a high school culture. The lack of equity and access to these principal features that should be in a high school makes the students feel unwanted, which is what my students have expressed due to the lack of this district's actions towards creating a safe and playable football field. Students in Hiram Johnson feel alienated because nothing has been done to address their concerns, and this has also given the campus a bad reputation. The problem here ultimately ends up not being the lack of access to a safe field, but rather the reality that the Hiram Johnson students do not have equal opportunities based on the inequities found in their social economic location. The ramifications of the students not having a field are numerous, but the potential benefits of our students are even greater. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Christina Pinales, followed by Elsa Esparza. Thank you. 
Good evening. My name is Christina Penales, and I am currently a senior who is attending Hiram Johnson High School. And I've played soccer for Hiram Johnson since my freshman year. I've made all my friends on the field, and to come back this fall and hear our field has been closed and unplayable was kind of frustrating for me because because it was due to the like the increase of the gopher holes, it was a violation and safety codes because so many students were getting injuries. But if we had if we had received a if we had received support and um, like a grant to provide a new field, we would be able to have home games. And we would be able to practice better without having the fear of injuries. With it, with a new field, it can attract more school spirit, more more parents, and who would want to actually come and support our team. Teams play on the field, and I know I mentioned earlier that I am a senior who is almost going to graduate. But so you guys might wonder, like, why does it? matter for me to get a new field. The reason why it matters to me to get a new field is because not only it's not only about the team, it's about the bonds that we create and the and the memories that we also create too because for us students we see the soccer like all the clubs and all the sport teams, we see that as an escape to get away from all our problems at home. And even and uh, release our stress and forget forget about everything. And we make new friends and develop teamwork skills, and without the grant, it would not be possible to, to have what we have. Thank you. Thank you. Also Sparza. Hello, I'm also Sparza from Hiram Johnson High School. I've played multiple sports at Hiram Johnson High School throughout all four years, but only one sport gave me a life-changing injury, soccer. While playing soccer for Hiram Johnson, I've gotten twisted ankles from the potholes and I've torn both quads, quad muscles. My left quad muscle will never fully recover anymore. The potholes and gopher holes need to be fixed. And I don't only mean the soccer field and the football field, but the baseball and softball field, the dugouts need help too. I love playing for Hiram Johnson and I love the coaches and so does everybody else that's here to speak on this subject. But I said, like I said earlier, our field needs a lot of work. This soccer season, Johnson didn't have not one soccer game or practice time out on our field because it was deemed unplayable. I will be graduating in June, but I don't want the future generations that will attend Johnson to go through what I did and many of my fellow teammates did. Being a Johnson student has changed me and helped me. We shouldn't be neglected nor left behind with better, without better facilities because of the reputation we have. I'm, I'm not saying that Johnson is the only school hurting, but because... Oh, but we're not, like, because there's other schools hurting. But us, the Hiram Johnson Warriors, we deserve a, a, a field just as much as any school in our district. I'm not saying that because Kennedy or Burbank has a good facility that they have better students and everything. But Johnson, like somebody said earlier, because of where we're at, nobody wants to attend our games. Our homecoming games, nobody wants to attend because we have nowhere to put everybody. Our homecoming game this year, Teachers had to pitch in for our lights. It is very hard to go to a school that nobody wants to go to because we have no field, we have no good sportsmanship because we have no facility to play on. Thank you. Thank you. Sabrina Lee with Janae Mark and Elizabeth Acosta. Hi, my Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the school board. My name is Sabrina Lee, and I'm currently a senior at Hiram Johnson High School. Hi, I'm Janae Mark, um, sophomore. I'm Elizabeth Madrigal. Uh, I'm a senior at Hiram Johnson. We are the captains of Hiram Johnson Ladies Warriors varsity softball team. As you can see, we're in our softball uniforms right now. We just came back from playing Burbank High School. This is the second time we played them at their field because their field was 
because our field was too dangerous to play on. To play on with all the gopher holes. Hiram Johnson is known as the ghetto school by many teams, schools, and community members because our facilities are in such despair and neglect. Neglect. Competition-wise, we're always at the bottom half of the league. Most of our teams have little to no experience when it comes to playing sports. We shouldn't have to have fear at the back of our head when practicing on our very own field. While we practice, we don't practice in some parts of the field because we are so scared that while we are running for a ball, we might step in a gopher hole and get injured. And that's literally what we go through every day during warm-up. At least one of us has to trip or our ankle like just pop because we step in something. Not being able to practice at our full potential has put us in such disadvantage competitively. And it's so sad that most schools use us as batting practice. On top of what my co-captains have said, it's very disappointing and frustrating for seniors because we will not be able to have our senior night on our home field. For the past three years, personally, I have been dreaming about my last home game on that field, and we won't even be able to have one because our field was condemned. Um, it's We're the only team in the league that doesn't have home games, and we just want safe fields for everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ryan Peterson, followed by Eric Saucedo. Good evening. I'm Ryan Peterson uh, from Hiram Johnson High School. I'm the varsity women's soccer coach. Uh, thank you, board, for, for uh, hearing the, the comments of our students. Um, our, our athletes and our students are fantastic. They're, it's a great Great school to be a part of. I've been in this, this is my second year teaching, second year at this school, and I can't imagine being anywhere else. Immediately upon taking the, the position of teaching here at Hiram Johnson and coaching at Hiram Johnson, I identified the fact that we did not have facilities that were comparable to schools or school districts in our surrounding area. I moved here from Yuba City. All three of the high schools in Yuba City have all weather, all season tracks with lights. All weather fields for practice. We do not. We're Sacramento. We are the capital of California. And yet of our five high schools, two have all-weather fields that are lighted. Soccer, CIS, brilliant decision to move soccer both to winter sports is fantastic. My soccer team gets approximately an hour and 15 minutes of contact time from the end of school until it's too dark to play. Assuming that, we have a, an area of the field that we can find enough space to play on. What we truly need at both McClatchy and at Hiram Johnson, is a lighted, all-weather surface that is safe and efficient. What you will see is you'll see the competitive nature of our students drive and grow as you see their ability to practice at full speed. And again, it is not, it's more than just athletics. Athletics is part of the high school experience. I went to high, four different high schools in four different states. And every single one of them, everywhere, all over the nation, Athletics is one of the founding uh, portions of your high school experience. It drives who you are as an adult. It drives your ability to be a team member, how to, how to lead. The leadership that we see from our athletes is truly astounding. Please give them a safe place to practice and play. Thank you. Eric Salcedo, followed by Christian Castillo. Good evening, board members. My name is Eric Salcedo, and I'm the men's soccer coach at Harmon Johnson High School. And I'm also a proud teacher at this district. I'm here to briefly state, briefly state my concerns and experiences on the conditions of a sports field and how those conditions affect our students. As you already know, uh, sports are part of the high school experience and an extension of the classroom where students learn and practice skills and abilities to help them become responsible and respectful individuals. It is our responsibility to ensure that the spaces we offer for students to practice their sport are in playable conditions and our students deserve that we do so. Our sports programs face many challenges that are difficult to address. 
such as such challenges are, for example, our winter sport, as, as it was already mentioned, uh, when we have to somehow adapt to the weather, uh, very limited daylight and no access to lights. Uh, on top of this, unplayable fields. Our fields were deemed unplayable uh, during the winter season about a week before start, we started our competition. Um, as coaches, our number one priority is to safe, the safety of our athletes from injury prevention to immediate response when the injuries does occur. As you have already heard, our students have suffered from severe injuries as a result of falls and uneven surfaces on our fields. Unplayable fields also means that we can't practice, and if we did, we would be putting our students in danger. Men's and women's soccer were forced to practice, practice inside in our gyms when they were available. We thank our athletic director for providing the space, but running sessions for an outdoor sport inside a gym was not efficient, and our students were very disappointed. Another issue with not having a home field is not having home games. Our student athletes spend a lot of time on the road playing all away games and not working on their academics. Leaving class early or coming back to school late at night after competition with a full day of responsibilities the next day is a stress that our student athletes have to endure. Uh, we ask you to please consider these challenges as you take your vote today, and we trust that you will uh, put students first. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christian Castillo, and I currently attend Hiram Johnson High School. I am currently a senior, and I have been a part of the soccer program for four consecutive years. And one thing that I've noticed throughout the whole time that I've been there is our field. Yes, we do consider them to be really bad, and it's for a good reason as well. There's a lot of gopher holes, and the season moving to winter did not help at all because of less daylight that we had especially because we didn't have lights to be able to practice during that time. The, or my soccer experience, at least, was cut very short on my final year of playing because of this, because we weren't able to practice outside of our fields because of how bad they were, not just because of gopher holes. They had mud, all the rain, everything else that we had to uh, go through that experience. It made us actually have to practice indoors. And for like how he had said, in a, when you're playing an outdoor um, game indoors, it doesn't really help for when you're trying to compete against other schools like Burbank and Kennedy. They have these uh, resources available to them while we have to practice indoors while they, they get to um, actually benefit from what they have already. Um, another thing that we did also have to experience was not having any home games, which really affects a player, especially because of the, all that support that you get during those home games, especially when we would go to other um, schools and they had so many people there, it's like the atmosphere was just for them. It was there. We did not have a single game where we were able to experience this on our own. And, and another thing too, because of us not having any uh, a home field, we didn't even get a senior game this year. One thing that you really look up to those four years is that one final game where you just get to experience your final high school game and we didn't even get one. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Ensan Shanpanta. Hello, my name is Ensan Shakimula, and I have been attending Harm Johnson High School for two years, and I am a junior. I am a student who have uh, transferred from Luther Burbank High School, and the first thing I've realized, uh, the differences between uh, the fields are... Um, are the... how, how Burbank has a very good um, turf field compared to uh, our Hiram Johnson field, but that hasn't stopped me from doing what I love, which is continuing to play soccer. And for the last two years that I've been playing uh, soccer, I've realized that there was a lot of, um, I've realized how it doesn't attract you. You don't feel it when you enter the, the field, how you feel at Burbank. Uh, it's just, it just you don't feel motivated. You don't feel hyped when you step on the field and you play out there with other students, unlike Burbank. But um, there are little things I've been noticing, like my um, like my partner have said. There's been a lot of injuries, and I have been a witness, and I've seen many of that happen throughout my two years of playing soccer. Um, other little issues that have caused us 
is uh, lack of practice um, due to lights, of course, and we are always skipping classes to go to our away games since this year we currently had no home games. Um, and, um, and what I'd like to say is that um, it's just the atmosphere doesn't feel the same. We would like to, we wish we would have had home games. We would have had students coming out and supporting our team. But I have heard from many students, they did not want to, most of them didn't want to play. Soccer did not attract them while being at Hiram Johnson because due to the field. And I just hope we do something about that and cause a change. Thank you. Thank you. Brian Nelson, followed by Cody Tuyen. Good evening. I'm Brian Nelson. I'm a parent of a McClatchy High School student. And I'd like to start by saying, Hiram Johnson supporters, you guys rock. I'm <laughs> what a great show. And, and if I could just ask everybody who's here in support of this agenda item to please rise and show this board how important this issue is to all of us. I'm here for two reasons. One is to thank you, to thank the board for listening to the students, for listening to the community. We've been talking about this for a long time, and uh, we're grateful that uh, we've got your attention, and we're grateful that you recognize the importance of, of having fields that are safe for all students, not just the sports teams, but for all students, the athletics it's important for the kids to play on, on, on safe, safe places, so we, we thank you for that. Uh, assuming that you vote in favor of this agenda item, I just my second point is I have a plea, uh, and my plea is that you act judiciously in the way that these funds are spent. Um, uh, we ask that you act judiciously in the allocation of the funds uh, per school according to the needs of the schools. Uh, we act, I ask that you, you act ju judiciously uh, in accordance to the, the, the needs of the respective campuses of the schools that you, you do elect to provide the funds for. And, and finally, that the, that the improvements that are made are sustainable. You know, not just a short fix, not something that's going to last just a short period of time, but let's think uh, wisely about how the funds are spent so that maybe we can build on it later as more funds become available later on because... The, the schools have great needs, and it's, it's likely that the funds that are allocated tonight won't be the long-term fix. But let's, let's spend those funds wisely. Thank you. Thank you. Cody Tuyen, followed by Rajal Johnson. Hello, board members. My name is Cody Sien, and I am currently a senior at Hiram Johnson High School. And I've been on the track team for four years now, and I'd like to discuss to you about the conditions of the track. So around the edges of the track, it's gotten bare down to basically the concrete. It's no longer a track. And towards the inside, it's basically dirt. And when it rains, it floods the track, and we, are, we aren't able to practice. And following with that, we do not have a proper discus ring. So what we have to do is basically draw a circle on the concrete about roughly the standard. And our shot put ring is on a hill. So whenever we throw shot put, if we throw it on the hill, it'll roll down and we can't clearly mark our distances. And with the condition of the field, it's really hard to find a coach or like an assistant coach. Any person that tries to coach track, they'll come out for like half the season and they'll disappear on us. And with our AD being our coach and having other sports go around, he doesn't have that time to really help us improve. So we've gone to YouTube to learn techniques, forms, anything. And it's gotten to the point where me as a senior, I have to coach new coming runners like with discus, shot put, hurdles, high jump, all that. And that doesn't give me time to practice myself. And I hope you consider this and 
help us get a new field so that maybe in the future people will like to come to Johnson and coaches will like to come to Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. Roger Johnson, followed by Zachary Neff. Hello, my name is Roger Johnson. I am a varsity football and basketball player at Hiram Johnson High School. The Sac City athletic facilities have been a major issue for many, many years. I am entering my senior year at Hiram Johnson High School, and unfortunately, Johnson, like other Sac City schools, has been in a rut. And alumni members, staff, and students have been deprived of the true high school experience. The football field, baseball field, softball field, and swimming practice facilities all are needing of improvements. The field and track also affect the PE program since it is unsafe for students to perform physical activities on the field. Bond measure Q funds cannot solve all the issues, but hopefully a temporary answer can better the environment and school spirit at Hiram Johnson and all other schools until a more permanent solution can come about. We, the representatives of Hiram Johnson High School, do not want to complain and whine for Hiram Johnson. We would love to advocate for all the other schools deserving upgraded athletic facilities. It is not fair to request our facilities to be upgraded more or to be prioritized over any other schools whatsoever. We believe all students deserve to be on the same platform and that sports facilities is the first step in turning that belief into a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, President Neff, I think you're next. Hi, I'm Zachary Neff. I'm a 11th grader at CK McClatchy High School, as well as a rugby player and football player, as well as the student body president. As such, I come with the agitations of the student body and student athletes, and to further the support for the allocation of money for athletic fields at the five comprehensive schools. Um, you might notice I'm a little muddy because I came just came from rugby practice. Um, the problem is I didn't come from McClatchy Fields. I came from a local park next to McClatchy. Now this is just one meager agitation of student athletes on McClatchy. All the sports and physical education classes are affected by our fields. Soccer kicks around water for their games. Track runs and hold track dirt. Tennis hits balls with and jumps over cracks in their court. Softball fields ground balls when there's holes in their outfield. And football walks to every game from their field to Sac City High School and has to end practice short. Now, I came with, uh, we did a student survey at CK McClatchy High School and I have one specific uh, survey I'd like to read from Olivia Smith, a uh, freshman. She described the McClatchy fields as hard to practice. During the race season, it is hard, impossible to play on the field due to the large amount of water that floods it. This really cuts down on practice time, forces us to practice in places like the gym that are less than ideal. Even when, even when the rainy season is over, the field is ruined from the water. There is dirt and grass patches scattered throughout the field. It is almost impossible to find a flat enough surface to actually pass the ball without hitting a bump, making practice difficult to do. I would love to see an all-weather field put in the drainage. This would increase the number of days that teams would be able to practice, making our school better at key sports like soccer, football, track, and etc. This would help draw more athletic people to our school, enriching both our athletics and educational departments. Now, I'm a junior at McClatchy, and my time is almost up, but Olivia Smith is just a freshman. She has three more years to experience good athletic fields and to live the American dream that most traditional high schools experience. Thank you. Thank you. Amos Carlson, followed by Gabby Stallings. Hi, I'm Amos Carlson. 
I'm a junior at McClatchy, and I've run cross country and track all three years. Listening to the concerns voiced by Hiram Johnson students, it sounds really familiar, because at McClatchy, we have a lot of the same problems. I've seen friends have their seasons ended by injuries again and again caused by our track, and even one whose career was ended because his hamstring was torn so badly trying to sprint on our sandy, bumpy field. I've seen soccer practices essentially ruined by the conditions of the field because it's impossible to pass the ball or shoot when the fields are as bumpy and muddy as they are. I think it's telling that, of the, that Hiram Johnson and McClatchy have been essentially the only two schools that are here. And I think what that speaks to is that the track and field facilities and soccer and football field facilities that Hiram Johnson and McClatchy specifically lack are the ones that affect the most students. Because between track and field, cross country, football, and soccer, you have hundreds of students just at the schools alone who play those sports, using them every year. And that's not counting all the PE classes who use it and all the members of the community who can use these facilities. So I would ask the board to prioritize these issues because these are the ones that affect the most students. The track and the field can affect hundreds of students every single year. And both McClatchy and Hiram Johnson are in need of them as soon as possible. So I would ask you to please support this measure and please remember that although all schools need facilities in our district, some schools need more funding in certain areas than others. And so to please prioritize McClatchy and Hiram Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, my name is Gabby Stallings. I'm the PTSA president at McClatchy High School. Thank you for having this on the agenda tonight. I really appreciate that as most of us do here tonight. Uh, the mission, or at least part of the mission of the PTSA is to improve the student experience during your, our children's uh, school careers from grade school all the way, at least through high school. Uh, is to promote, it's also to promote the academic and extracurricular activities, and to ensure the provision of healthy and safe school environments for our children. Uh, currently, McClatchy Fields, uh, courts, and track are subpar. Uh, the track, as we've heard, uh, is full of ruts. It's full of grass lumps. Uh, there are turned ankles all the time. The courts have up to inch-wide inch cracks in them. Uh, and the fields have sinkholes and are also in deplorable condition for soccer and football. The athletic fields and facilities serve the entire school community at McClatchy High School because our classes uh, for physical education, which are required for the first couple of years of their education there, are held outdoors on these facilities. Renovation of these facilities will ensure our students' health and safety while they pursue their academic experience and their athletic endeavors. As a neighbor, as a parent of CK McClatchy students who participate in track, tennis, baseball, soccer, uh, I encourage the board to allow the maximum allocation of this $10 million from uh, measure Q to renovate the CK McClatchy fields. Thank you very much for tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Caitlin Dendas, followed by Perry Rogers. Hi, my name is Jennifer Rodriguez, and um, I'm a junior at CK McClatchy, and these are my fellow teammates. They are also captains of the softball team. The softball program has won all Metro for the past six years, but we, cannot, we can no longer risk the absence of many players due to poor conditions on our softball fields. The McClatchy High School softball field is extremely injury prone due to many potholes that are seen throughout the outfield, as well as a foul territory fence that curves underneath that is that many people have fa almost fallen on that could cause many future injuries. For the parents, there is no seating, and 
in order to watch the players and the field is not handicap accessible which is also a hazard um, throughout the rainy seasons our field is unplayable because of extreme flooding as well as grass continuously growing over our dirt not only our field but other athletic fields as well um, football has to pay fourteen thousand dollars to rent a field in order to play a sport that represents our school but half of the time they lose so many players because of poor conditions of their practice fields that are at McClatchy. We have players on softball and baseball who have verbally committed to colleges and are risking their college careers due to, um, due to the, poor, the poor fields that are at McClatchy. Safety is our main concern as it should be yours. CKM and Johnson are the two oldest high schools in Sacramento and have received virtually um, no field improvements. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Perry Rogers, followed by Donovan Blankenship. Good evening, SUSD board members. I'm here to ask you to fund a new track for McClatchy High School. I will attend McClatchy next year, and I go to California Middle School right now. The current track behind the school is ill-kept and uneven, and this poses a hazard to the students that use it. The quarter-mile track is made of dirt and gravel. After it rains, students are forced to run on mud. I, along with 850 other students, run on the track, and we don't attend McClatchy. You see, the California Middle School PE classes and the track team use the high school, along with McClatchy students. So about 3,400 students use the track every year. Rosemont High School, which recently had a new track built, is a school with only, that only about 1,200 students attend. Track team members are expected to run through puddles and still somehow complete a lap in 90 seconds. Furthermore, the fact that there is more lawn than track at some places hinder runners even more and prevent them from reaching their, their full potential. We should not be teaching a double standard. Telling students to do their best and giving them subpar training locations is unacceptable. I ask you this. Do you want students to achieve because of the athletic facilities they are given or in spite of these obstacles? Thank you. We need to know your name, please. Donovan Blankenship. Thank you. <laughs> McClatchy can't wait to get you, whoever you are. Could please. <laughs> and speech and debate, yeah. <laughs> Hello, board members. I am Donovan Blankenship, a uh, senior at Hiram Johnson uh, High School. I am somewhat of a foreigner to this school district as I transferred in only four months ago, but in my relatively short amount of time being at Hiram Johnson, from what I've noticed from like the fields and the track and field area, there are, the conditions there are just reprehensible. I mean, I almost twisted or broke my ankle. I, mean, I, I twisted my ankle and I could have broken it on the field over one of those scoper holes. And that could have ended my season as a swimmer. Uh, speaking of swimming, the uh, pool does not have like the necessary things to make it be used for our home games. And recently, we've been having to do dry practices because of a pH problem. So, we since we've been having to do dry practices, we've been having to go onto the field, which is. It's kind of dangerous considering the amount of hazards on the field. When we had to do a practice yesterday, we had to do a run on the track, which is showing all the way to the concrete on the sides and not really, it's not really leveled. So I ask of um, you, the board members, to accolade some funds to Hiram Johnson's fields. And with this, hopefully it might change, might make an effect on you. Thank you. Thank you. Sierra Camargo followed by Edward Camargo. Hello, my name's Sierra Camargo. 
I was a student at Hiram Johnson. I graduated in 2011. So we've been at this for quite some time. Um, back then, we did the same thing, but unfortunately, our voice got stopped. Uh, it didn't get this far, so they got pretty far. Um, we tried for a lot of things. We fundraised. We went through the Kellogg's fundraiser. Fortunately, we got second place. Still wasn't bad. But instead of a field like we wanted to, we got a gym. We really didn't need a gym, but instead, that is what we got. Um, our field has been really bad, and it has gotten worse. I was uh, in track and field. The track wasn't that bad back then, but it still had holes. Um, I fell a couple times. We would have to go to Grant High School most of our, our um, games or tournaments, <laughs> um, which for some of us was kind of too far to go. We would have to find our own rides, and myself couldn't go to many of them. Um, I have two siblings there now, a brother and a sister, and I would really love for them to have games there. They were special when I went there. We, um, you know, for our games, they were always cut either short or homecoming. We couldn't do much because of the field. Um, and I would just love for them to fix it. I know you've heard a lot from us today. Um, but, you know, when we come together, we come together big. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Edward Camargo. I just got up here. My time's up. <laughs> <laughs> we just love you. <laughs> I know. Like, I haven't been here before, right? <laughs> Good evening, board. My name is Edward Camargo. I am an alumni of Hiram Johnson. I'm a proud parent. And I'm also an activist for this community and my students. I'm up here not to talk about how bad Hiram Johnson needs money for their fields. You guys have heard a lot of that. Even McClatchy's come up, let you know how they are. What I do want to point out is how our students at Hiram Johnson, after hearing the McClatchy story, took it upon themselves to speak up. They put signs out on the street. They got the attention of the media and you and got their message across. One of those children were mine. So I'm very proud that she has a voice to be able to stand up and speak and tell you, the school board, how the conditions at their school are. Because as, parent, as a parent, I see the injuries. I attend the sports uh, you know, events, I see how bad it is, and every time I speak to it, I'm just a parent speaking. When you hear it from the students, you're hearing it firsthand from what they're going through, the safety concerns that they have, the things that they have to deal with, both not only at Hiram Johnson, but also at McClatchy, and the, the, the things that are needed to make our schools safe. The number one priority of this school board should be keeping our kids safe. That is what I'm up here for, to relay that from them to you to let you know not only are our children standing up and speaking for what needs to be done, but so are the parents, alumni, and staff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Miguel Gonzalez followed by Jonah Brodke. Um, hi, I'm Miguel Gonzalez. I'm a freshman at Hiram Johnson. And the uh, field conditions at our school are very unsafe. There are many gopher holes, as you guys have heard tonight. And it's just, it's scary that you have to walk into that field thinking, I can possibly get injured in my season or possibly even my career. And it's, that's not right. That should not be the case for any school. And um, we had one home, like one Friday night home game, and that was our homecoming. And I remember that night very nice because I was on the field playing football and it was just, it was overwhelming that I had people there supporting me to win. 
And we don't get that on the Saturday games because no one wants to come and spend the weekend to do that. But on Fridays, you know, they, they like to come. And um, the like walking into other schools every Friday night and uh, seeing how their school is there almost every game supporting them for home games. It's just, it's, it doesn't, it makes me jealous in a way. And that's also not right. And um we're trying to at Hunter Johnson. We're trying to change the culture from uh, how it is now. People are like not acting well, but I think if we can get the right uh, funding for our fields and change our culture um, from at our sports, we can change the culture at our school and be a better school overall. And that's just from a football perspective. You've heard it from soccer, uh, track and field, softball and baseball. So hopefully. We get the message across. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Final speaker is Joan Abadke. Hello, my name is Jonah Wiener Brodke. I'm a junior at McClatchy and I'm also a three-year cross-country and track athlete. Um, I'd like to start off by elaborating on um, some of the terrible conditions that we've already heard about today. Um, today, it was raining, and generally, when it rains, our track becomes unusable. We like to joke that there's Lake McClatchy that forms there, um, and it does not dry up for several weeks, making the track unusable. Um, today, our sprinters, about five hours ago at practice, ran their workout in the parking lot at school. Several times when it's been raining before, um, they've run their workouts in the halls of school. I think that we can all agree that this is ridiculous. Um, we've heard a lot tonight about how um, renovating athletic facilities will benefit students and student athletes, uh, but we really haven't talked about how it will benefit the surrounding communities uh, for McClatchy Land Park. Um, Generally, when our track is unusable, which is most of the time, um, we run our workouts in Land Park um, in the surrounding community. Um, and this has led to uh, forcing runners to dodge, um, dodge dogs, other pedestrians, pedestrians with strollers, even running around cars. Um, and I think, again, we can all agree that uh, this is a great safety concern for um, McClatchy athletes, and for members of the Land Park community. Um, so please, on behalf of the McClatchy, uh, of McClatchy students, McClatchy athletes, and as well as Hiram Johnson students and athletes, and the surrounding communities of both schools, I strongly urge the board to take action in, um, in renovating the athletic facilities at both schools. Thank you. Thank you. No more comments. All right. Thank you all for your comments. Do we have any board questions or comments? Uh, Ms. Pritchett. Thank you, President Hansen. First, I, before I get to my comment, I do have a quick question for Mr. Dobson. Can you just tell me um, in relation to the um, agenda item that we were well, we actually um, doing the bond, um, can you tell me a timeline of when you would have to hire contractors to do summer work? Well, before we could actually hire them, we would need to do the assessment with the school, so that's going to take a fair amount of time. But if we had that, the latest would be probably in early May, so we would need to award that, uh, that bid. Award them by then. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thank you. That was my one question I had for you. Okay, so first off, I just wanted to thank everyone that came out tonight. You guys braved the rain and came out here and showed a lot of pride for each of your schools. Um, it's great to see so many of you out there. When I saw the rain, I thought, oh boy, no one's going to come out in that. And here you are, <laughs> loud and proud. <laughs> um, we... Um, I am the chair of the facilities committee, and we are fully aware of the issues that are happening throughout our district, including the gopher hole, hole, um, holes and other issues in our um, throughout the entire district. It's not just McClatchy and Hiram Johnson. Um, 
So uh, we, as chair of the facilities committee, I have asked the facilities department to um, at, to complete assessments of our five comprehensive high schools. And of those high schools, the, and just in case you're wondering, that includes um, Hiram Johnson, Kennedy, McClatchy, Burbank, and Rosemont High School. Those are our five com comprehensive high schools. Um, our committee, um, and if you're wondering, uh, Member Minnick and Vice President Ryan sit on the committee with me, and we are dedicated to equity. Um, as we co and when we um, we have asked for these assessments to be done, and we as a committee will be combing through them with a fine tooth comb to finding out where the needs are mostly needed in our district. Um, I wrote it down because I want to make sure I didn't forget to tell you guys anything. <laughs> um, we're also taking into consideration um, what has been given out on prior bonds with Q and R and our other bonds. I think it was I and E. Thank you. Um, and we'll also be taking that into consideration when we sit down as a committee. And um, I'll be putting in a, um, a request for um, an assessment to be also be done at West Campus and Sac High. It, um, I want to say that um, though this um, agenda item just has to be um, is just pertaining to our five comprehensive high schools, this committee is um, committed to finding additional funding for these other schools. Um, and let me see, this item um, will be coming up next. Our facilities committee will be meeting at the end of the month. I believe it's the 26th. And we'll be discussing then our next steps. And um, I know that my other committee members probably have some things to say, but um, just know that we are committed and we know that there are issues and we want to keep you safe. We want to give you a place that you'll be proud to play. Um, so um, you'll, I'm sure you'll be seeing changes. Just, just keep on us. Keep coming out. Keep showing your pride. Um, <laughs> and uh, with that, I, I know that other people want to speak, but I will put in a motion to approve item 10.1 I. Second. Board Member Vang. Good evening, everyone. So I just um, wanted to take this opportunity to actually thank all the students from Hiram Johnson and McClatchy for coming out and really having the courage to advocate for your school and really to share your experience about what's happening on the field. And so I just want to commend each and every one of you for you know, taking time out of your busy schedule, homework time to come out here and really share your story. Um, the second thing I would also say is I'm not on the facilities committee, but I have full confidence um, in my co colleagues, uh, Trustee Jesse Ryan, Christina Pritchett, and Michael Meenick, that they will do their very best as uh, you know we do this assessment for the comprehensive high school, and that we ensure that there's equity, right? Really looking at what the needs are at these school site levels to ensure that we address your needs. And so I just wanted to say that publicly that I have full confidence in my in uh, the facilities committee. I do also encourage you um, not just to come here during the school board meetings, but also to attend the facilities committee uh, that board uh, board member Pritchett talked about on on the 26 because I really feel like that's where um, you can also you know vocalize uh, some of your concerns um, I don't know what the timeline is and I don't know if uh, Mr. Dobson is going to speak on this or if Christina will report back um, but I because I know tonight just so that my understanding is that tonight we're just approving uh, the 10 million dollars but we're the agenda is going to come back to the board to be approved in terms of how the allocation will will be done is that correct Christina yeah, so there's not really a timeline at this point because okay. we need to do the assessments. Once the assessments are completed, then the facilities committee will get together and figure out um, how the allocations will be placed because it won't just be $2 million for each of the school sites. We'll figure out which are our most needy school sites and then apply that. And so we'll work, put in the recommendation after we get the assessments done. And as you heard from Mr. Dobson, that's going to take some time to complete those assessments, but okay. we're on it. Okay. <laughs> and then I have a second question for follow up. So, you know, um, from what I really heard tonight, the $10 million sounds like a lot. And it sounds like we need like also a long term strategy in sustaining funding for improvement, upkeep of our fields. 
whatnot. Is the facility committee in charge of that? Are we directing staff? I, I'm wondering like what the process is to that we're not just focused on this $10 million, but what really as a school district are we doing in terms of long-term strategy to ensure that you know we're keeping the upkeep of the facility? Because I think that's really important. There's a master plan for that, and then the facilities committee will be discussing that as well. Okay. Member Ryan. Thank you. So I just want to start by giving um, major props to all of the students who came out to speak tonight on a school night, and I know we're going into a later hour. In particular, I want to just call out the courage and tenacity and really articulate words of our Hiram Johnson students. Um, frankly, I think, you know, it was pretty remarkable to me when I saw in social media and on the paper, in the paper, posters that you had made and hung around your fields. And one word that stood out to me above all else was the word equity. And something that has really hit me, um, representing Oak Park and some of the surrounding poorest areas in Sac City Unified, is that when we look at the total allocations of bond monies, there has been some question as to what the equity is among some of our poorest schools. And so to have you as students call that out and say, yes, absolutely all of our fields deserve an opportunity to have the necessary repairs, but we are not throwaway students. We deserve equitable shares of resources, and we're going to fight for those resources. And this is just the beginning of making our voices heard. I was incredibly proud of you, and I hope that this is just the beginning of your advocacy, because too many of you said to me that Hiram Johnson is seen as a ghetto school. And I have to tell you, I have been to Hiram Johnson on many occasions. I've had many performances that I've had a chance to sit in in high school graduations in your beautiful auditorium, and I do not view your school as a ghetto school. Your school is a school on the rise. Your school is a school that is exciting to me, and I think it's going to be a place that we have more and more families with the help of trustees like Ellen Cochran and Michael Minnick encouraging people to be a part of. And frankly, you're the leaders that start that. So thank you so much for coming out and having such a strong voice tonight. I also want to say that I agree this $10 million is just a portion of what needs to happen in terms of total repairs, and athletic fields are just one element of the repairs we need to see at our school sites and equitable allocations at those school sites. I know that Trustee uh, Pritchett, as the facilities chair, has committed to do an assessment of SAC High's needs as well as West Campus. Frankly, SAC High is our only high school in Area 7 serving some of our poorest students, students who often don't have a voice, and it is a district facility that's falling into disarray. And I think the students there deserve to be proud and hold their heads high, just as our Hiram Johnson students deserve, just as our McClatchy students deserve, and the others that we've outlined for this initial investment. Thank you. <laughs> Member Cochran. Last week, I drove down 65th Street. I was at a meeting at West Campus, and I was going home thinking about dinner. And as I drove by Hiram Johnson, I saw the fence attired with signs that were quite wonderful. What has happened tonight is really interesting for the Hiram Johnson uh, students for one particular reason. Adults are talking about the money, and adults are driving a lot of the petitioning that's going on. But the Hiram Johnson student movement is exactly that. The students put those signs up. They decided to do it, and they are the motivation behind what's going on here tonight. This is truly unique and something that needs to be lauded and brought to the attention of all of the board members here. This is not a parent-driven or a group-driven or a teacher-driven effort. These are the students of Hiram Johnson speaking to you, addressing you, asking you to look at their fields and give them equity. So I am your board member, if you didn't know. Um, you can, you know, shoot me with arrows after the meeting if you'd like, or work um, with me as 
I've been doing with Michael Minnick, um, the other board member who has students who go to Hiram Johnson to effect change. It's very difficult. It comes down to dollars and the bag is not filled with green dollar bills. And there are, are many schools that need work in the district. We are moving forward. We're going to spend this $10 million and we do have a master plan that's going to be examined. On a philosophical note, this society is not going to cure many of its ills until it puts true value on children, families, security and safety and education for them. And this is a prime example here in this district that we cannot have fields without holes in them, we cannot have students without hurting their ankles, and that we are not providing safe, secure schools for them. It's a big philosophical question, but students who make signs, raise their voices, and ask for change can change this attitude. Thank you. Member Minnick. All right, well, I hate to repeat what we've already heard up here, but I, I was blown away by all the advocacy I, I heard tonight, all the uh, emails I received from parents, uh, from teachers. Um, I think my big takeaway from this is that, you know, every, everyone deserves that home field advantage. And we have schools that aren't getting that home field advantage. And it's putting you at a, at a disadvantage, you know, when you're competing. And that's not, that's not fair. Um, I think that, what was your name, Alejandro? Um, I think you were extremely eloquent when you said that it sucks. Yes, it sucks. Um, I don't want to hear about any students out there breaking their ankles over gopher holes. Like the safety of our kids is so important. And, you know, for, for those of you that have this long future in athletics, you know, I don't want us to be responsible for cutting that short. That's, that's not cool. So, I, you know, I really appreciate you all coming out. I drive by those signs every day, and it's a reminder of how, you know, much you need that. Um, and I've heard from many folks from McClatchy, you know, and I appreciate, you know, everything that I'm, I'm hearing. I absolutely um, agree that we, this, is a, this is a safety issue. This is an equity issue. This is really important. Um, my only question then for, um, I guess, um, Board Member Pritchett, um, regarding your um, ask regarding the assessments to um, add West Campus um, and SAC High. First, I want to thank you for that because I know that so West Campus doesn't have a safe space for their track and field, so they use city streets, and then they've been using Johnson, and now they can't use Johnson, um, so now they are got to find a... a you know, fourth option or whatever. Um, my question is, since this, um, since this allocation of funds was uh, written as for the five comprehensive high schools, um, does our ability to do those assessments that include SAC High and, and West Campus, does that then include those schools as possible um, recipients of fund based on Based on the needs that we we find, or is this um, separate um, separate money? Because I would because if well, I'll let you answer that first before I. So the answer is no. <laughs> um, the the assessments that I've asked for the additional high schools will have to work together as a committee to find additional funding for that. So then I, I guess my question is since. We are looking at this um, ten million dollars, and we don't at this point know where that money is going to go. We don't know where the greatest need is. Um, we don't know where the biggest safety risks are. Um, I would um, want to find out if are we at liberty to um, alter this um, this um, motion to include those schools, and then um, and so we can look openly at where all those needs are and then, you know, then, and then those decisions be made, uh, you know, after that assessment. So I, I, 
I mean, I, I think that anything can be brought back to the board. I think that we need to pass this tonight for the five comprehensive high schools. If you could imagine $10 million isn't going to cover a whole lot compared to the needs that are needed for these five comprehensive high schools. So I think it's going to be our job to identify additional funding. That, does that answer your question? Well, it, we can bring this back it, I mean, after we do assessments and figure out the needs. But at this time, I say that we do not alter the vote for the five comprehensive well, high schools. I absolutely don't want to slow down the process of, of getting money out there and, and figuring out what we need. Um, but I, I, I don't know what our options are in terms of if we wanted to um, uh, change the... Um, change this motion to include essentially seven schools and that there's no guarantee for any of these schools at this point where where that money's going to go it's all going to be dependent on what that survey um, assessment comes back as well i think a member ryan had a an interesting suggestion that okay. might be germane so I, I think the challenge here and it, it is something that i don't think we're going to get around is that $10 million is probably going to be insufficient to meet the needs of even the five schools we're talking about. Um, I absolutely do agree that we have to have an up-to-date assessment on SAC High and West Campus in order to determine what allocations need to happen moving forward. So I would like to propose a counter motion, which would be a compromise, right? So to, as part of our assessment, include SAC High and West Campus so we understand their needs, where they rank among the high schools, recognizing that the $10 million we have is currently spoken for among the five comprehensive high schools, and that beyond that, we are committing as a facilities committee and as a board to identify additional revenue streams. Can I just add, I, I don't think that this vote is about the assessments. I think that we as a facilities committee can recommend to the facilities department that they do an assessment of those high schools. This vote is based on the $10 million allocation just for the five comprehensive high schools. I think that it would be within our power to say that we could uh, direct the facilities committee to make that assessment and bring it to us as a board at a subsequent meeting uh, so that we can make the assessment public and then go forward from that point. I agree. I would feel more comfortable with that. I feel like if we don't include the language to identify the priorities among these two campuses, it might just drop off again. I think that'd be friend a friendly amendment to add an assessment for those two schools. I don't think that, okay. <laughs> uh, and Member Rosas. Hi, I'd just like to say thank you all so much for coming out, it really does mean a lot. I, I personally go to McClatchy and I know how the fields are and I've been to Hiram Johnson and I know the struggles that students face and I know how important it is to have updated facilities and to make sure that you know, you're know you safe and you don't go out there thinking, okay, well, am I going to trip? Am I going to get hurt? And it definitely affects your school environment when kids don't want to go out and watch the games because there's no space, there's nowhere to sit, there's nowhere to watch and it kind of affects lots of the... Um, I guess, not just the environment, but also the school spirit. And I completely support this measure. And I think it's really important to make sure that s students feel safe and that they have a good place to kind of have the whole well-rounded high school experience. So thank you guys so much for coming out on a school day and for really representing um, all the students in our district. Thank you. Member Minnick. I'm getting dirty looks for ringing my uh, light. My light again. I just didn't know if you were. No, no, no. Forgotten. Um, to so I'm, I'm, I'm good with the, um, with the, um, with the um, allocation. I, I would ask if I could ask um, Jim Dodson to, to come up one more time, and just um, if you could give us some sort of idea of, um, as we're talking about potential additional funding for these two other schools, um, what they're there may or may not be moving forward and in where we're at in any of those processes for, like trying to secure other funding. And if not, that's... Fine. I mean, honestly, we're going to have to 
turn over <laughs> every rock to find, you know, additional funding, um, you know, just to kind of put it in perspective and maybe to answer a little bit of Member Vang's question. So once the facilities department is done with the projects, the sustainability piece really then comes to Mr. Evepak and our maintenance department to maintain our facilities. And after all is said and done in his budget with the uh, unfunded mandates he has for boiler testing and fire alarm testing, he has about $1.1 million in maintenance funds to address all of the district facilities, elementary, middle, high school, admin sites, everything. So it's going to be a, a, a tough job for us to, to find more funding, but, you know, we will certainly um, leave no rock unturned. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, Jim, uh, before you leave, uh, to leave, Jim, it's my understanding that West Campus is already slated for field improvements. It is. So outside of this allocation, they're scheduled to get... Okay. So, well, just, I mean, I, I think that, you know, some of the things that we've looked at already is that, for example, we have um, Burbank and Rosemont on there. Both of them have relatively new uh, artificial uh, turf fields and, and all-weather tracks, but they also have soccer fields and softball fields that um, probably have uh, some needs as well. So. Uh, West Campus does have some other areas besides that field that will probably need to be addressed as well. Member Roses, your light is still... Okay, you're done. Oh, very good. Member Pritchett? I'm sorry. Uh, Member Cochran, you're next. Thank you. I am absolutely 100% against changing this item on the agenda. I do not want to dilute this process. This is, has been identified to approve 10 million allocation funded for out of measure Q for the five uh, field, com, uh, field improvements at the five comprehensive high schools. These are high need schools. You have citizens and students and parents begging you to do the repairs do not dilute this process you there are other measures and other efforts that can be made to look at the other schools do assessments and do the right thing but do not change what we have here tonight thank you member pritchett yeah your, your button's pressed if you want Okay, so I'm going to um, offer the amendment to my previous motion that we approve item 10.1i with the directive to staff that they will do an assessment of West Campus and SAC High. Second. Second. I have my voice on. Uh, you're number three now, so. Uh, Uh, well, we had a, a, a first and a second on the amendment. Uh, any questions on the amendment or comments on the amendment? Yeah. So I'd like clarification of what you're asking exactly. So in asking staff to do this, it's a floating request that has no connection to what's going on on this piece of paper tonight and what we're voting on. Would you clarify that, please? You're absolutely right. Could it you does restate not. that? Yes, absolutely. This I'm asking staff to do an assessment of SAC High and West Campus. What we're voting on as well is an approval of the $10 million, um, $10 million allocation for the five comprehensive high schools and that which does not include West Campus and SAC High. I really appreciate uh, you doing that. Isn't it rather unusual, though? Isn't that something that facilities committee could do themselves if during a facilities committee meeting to direct staff? Do we really need to vote on this? That's to, that's to, uh, chair, just say that's that to I, chair Pritchett. I would just say that it's important for us to do that just to show everybody that we're everything's being transparent. And normally it would be done behind the scenes because we're doing a thousand things all the time. No, I know it that. It just helps but, illustrate to the community the things that we're working on here. So I think it's important for everyone to know that we're being very transparent about this. Thank you. My question is to Member Pritchett, though. Member Pritchett, is that true that the facility committee normally does those types of things very easily and it's not really necessary to tie it to this item? That is correct. Thank you, Member Pritchett. Member Pritchett, your button is still pressed. Would you have no, more to say? No, I don't want to say anything else. 
Oh. <laughs> All right. Seeing no more numbers pressed, I will uh, take my privilege of getting to be the last one to speak. So I want to thank uh, everyone who's come here tonight uh, to address this very important issue. See, we've spent uh, an hour and a half uh, on an item that was all 10 items were slated for two minutes. So uh, obviously a very important item, and I really appreciate everyone uh, participating. Um, that's, you know, for the students that are here, you know, welcome to democracy. That's, that's what it looks like. So it's important. Uh, and to get to this point, we've actually spent probably two years of discussion. And I know the people that have been involved in this issue before any of us were even on the board, because most of us have only been here for a couple of years or less, have been working on this issue for a decade. Uh, and I heard that message very loud and clear from uh, the community that I work with the most, and that's the folks at McClatchy High School. And, uh, you know, they were very patient, usually, most of them, uh, and have educated me a lot uh, in the process. And I really appreciate that because it's given me an opportunity to learn a lot about how our facilities projects work, how our bonds are allocated, how the investments are made of our district, when people get elected to the school board, very rarely does anybody on a school board, and this accounts for the, there's 1,000 school districts in the state of California, very rarely do school board members get involved in facilities issues. It normally just happens very much at the staff level. So the fact that this board has learned so much about facilities, we have a facilities committee, which is pretty unusual for, and it's a public facilities committee, a standing committee, so that is highly unusual of all the districts in the state, we really take this issue seriously. And it's clear that uh, there's so much pride in our district and that athletics have such a big role to play in the development of students and the camaraderie and the teamwork that you learn there. It's, it's as, as, as important as academics. And it's not an either, either or. And I, and I heard from... Uh, a speaker, and I really appreciate uh, Member Pritchett coming to McClatchy for, uh, as the facilities chair for a Restore the Roar meeting that was extraordinarily well attended. And one of the folks who spoke there um, always was very ready to speak his mind, but he also mentioned that not only are the facilities just for the athletics teams, but they're for the PE, that it's a class too. And that was good for me to remember that because it, you know, there's a lot of things that we just have to learn and be reminded here because you know, this job is drinking from a fire hose, you know, every week. Um, you know, I've also taken the time to go meet with the, some of the staff and trustees at Sac City College. So I'm working on the football issue as well. And I had a meeting earlier today with the vice president of their, um, of the board there to talk about, you know, how we can do shared facilities. So, you know, I really appreciate the patience and everyone coming out here. So to me, I see... You know, there's a huge need, and just bond money isn't going to do it by itself. You know, we are fortunate that the taxpayers of this uh, community and the voters have approved strong bonds. We have a community that really supports uh, our schools, and they've showed that with the general, you know, with the, the bonds. But we also have to look to the general fund. That's where a lot of money should be coming for our facilities in the future as well. And that's how we're going to maintain facilities, and we need to continue to hear from our families and our communities that as we consider the budget in the next couple months that we start making a commitment out of our general fund to help fund uh, these projects and we need to c continue to fund maintenance and to do things so we don't fall so far behind we shouldn't have to deal with issues that should be routine maintenance issues having to come out of the fund so i really appreciate all the hard work that the facility staff has done over the years working with a really short budget. We're not going to let that happen in the next budget round. So that's what we need to do with general fund money. We need to make a, a commitment there, but we need to hear from families in the community like you've done in the last several meetings that it's something that's important to you. So with that, uh, we will move this item. I heard a motion and a second already. So let's call the vote. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Abstain. Allocation of $10 million is done. So congratulations. To all. You know, I'd, I'd like to invite the students who came here to, if you'd want to come down so we can do just a, 
a picture with some of the board members who'd like to join you for all the work that we've done. So. Just watch the front. We'll do the communication. We can. I didn't realize it was going to take almost two hours. Otherwise, I would have maybe moved that other one out there. I'll keep my report short. Why don't we go on to 11.0, Employee Organization Report, CSA, SCTA. <laughs> just barely, just barely. All right, good evening, members of the board. Nikki Malevsky, president of the Sacramento City Teachers Association. And as you know, our bargaining is at impasse, and we are scheduled for mediation on April 19th. Prior to the board's last meeting on March 16th, over 1,000 SETA members participated in a picket in front of this building to call attention to our collective effort to make Sac City into the destination district for California. Since then, we've learned a number of things that should have an impact on our bargaining. First, it is true that the district ended last fiscal year with a reserve fund balance of $98 million. Second, we have learned from the second interim budget that was presented on March 16th that the district has budgeted $61 million for the cost of active employees' health insurance, when the actual number, based on the actual December 16th enrollment numbers, was $44 million, a difference of $17 million. Third, also from the second interim budget, the district is allocating $27 million towards the cost of retiree health insurance, when the actual cost is expected to be only $17 million. That is another difference of $10 million. Fourth, in determining staffing for next year, in the K-12 traditional schools, the district is projecting an increase of enrollment of 290 students, which will result in another $3 million in revenue to the district. Fifth, the district has set aside $10.6 million as a contingency 
in the event that Proposition 55 failed? Well, as we all know, Proposition 55 passed. In short, when we look at it as a whole, and just looking at the dollars currently allocated in this budget, there are potentially more than $40 million that could be available without further tapping into the district's enormous reserve. But at the end of the day, Sac City can't become the destination district of California on the cheap. The resources are there, and the question remains, will this board be prepared to lead? And speaking of leadership, nearly seven years ago, hundreds of teachers, parents, students, and concerned community stakeholders came before this body to express their concerns regarding the leadership and direction at Hiram Johnson High School. Specifically, they asked for the principal, um, Cedros, to be removed. The then board and superintendent ignored their pleas until finally, after investigations and lawsuits and a great amount of harm and expenditure of public funds, he was finally removed. Last year, after lots of controversy and a letter from the Hiram Johnson staff asking for their community to be allowed to have a transparent and inclusive interview and hiring process like the other schools get to have, an interview process and choice like Theodore Judah principalship that you just announced tonight. Instead, this superintendent, with the concurrence of the board, appointed someone from Cedros's problematic administrative team to be their new principal. I see this as part of a bigger picture of neglect and misuse of funds. I was there that night all those years ago, as I am still here tonight, as teachers are still here fighting to get this district to prioritize its resources appropriately. When I see new chairs, in the offices upstairs. When I see food at meetings for administrators and district office staff, catered food. And when $10,000 is spent on one training for a few people in the equity office, and I hear about the conditions that these student athletes are trying to perform in at our school sites, it is so obvious where this district's priorities have been. And that needs to change. Thank you. SEIU, Teamsters, UPE. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Garrett Kirkland. I'm the principal of Einstein Middle School. I'm Cindy Hollander. I'm the principal at Sequoia. Um, we'd like to take a little time to talk about our facilities at our middle schools. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay. You're going to have to catch me later. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Well, we uh, thank you for your time tonight. We'll keep it brief. Um, we uh, understand that uh, the Teachers Association is negotiating and we really look at our jobs as working for the teachers and the students, the parents, the families of our communities. And so we both know that we have hardworking teachers that do great jobs for our schools. We're also in a negotiation, and we wanted to just give you a little bit of information because we think that's the key. So one example of how this works is the pay scale, and we wanted to let you know that like on Year 14, for example, if you have a teacher salary on C, D, or E, which is your units, that if you take their salary in C and divide it by 184 days that they work and the six hours that they work officially, we know our teachers work more than six, just as our administrators work more than eight. So if you take those salaries in C and compare it to an elementary school principal that's also in their 14th year as a principal, which means they probably worked at least three or more years as a teacher that do not register. So you take those 14 year teachers and a principal at an elementary school in 14 year. When you divide the days, we work 211, they work 184. And when you take the six and the eight, 
you'll see that a teacher in step C is making $66.63 an hour. The principal at 14th year is making $68.09 an hour. And if you're in D or E, they're making $69.95 and $73.46 an hour, which means that the only teacher per hour that we're making more of than is in the C column, and we're making $1.42 more an hour. The 14th year teacher in uh, D is making $1.86 more than we are an hour, and the teacher in E is making $5.30 more an hour. Now, in addition to that, they have benefits package that we don't have. In addition to that, when teachers do work above their hourly day, we have the ability to pay them for extra time, whether it's tutoring or coaching. We don't have that ability in our contract. So what ends up happening is straight across the board, even though we've maybe been, if we taught for seven or let's say six years, we've been in the district for 20 years, but our 14th year, we're making less per hour than a teacher in their 14th year, even though we may have been teaching for six before we started. So I wanted to bring that up because there was the Sacramento Bee article on March 24th saying school districts increasing spending on administrative payers faster than teachers. And there may be problems with that. But what we want to do is provide you information that the frontline leaders of this district who are working with your families, working with your labor unions, working with your students, working with your facilities, when you break down their hourly rate, even though we may have been working for 20 years, compared to a 14th year teacher in D and E, we're making less per hour with no ability to get paid extra compensation while they can if they are coaching, tutoring, running some kind of after school intervention or club. Going to a weekend event, which I've, a lot of people know, I appreciate the negotiating team, thank you everyone, but they've heard me say I've already worked nine Saturdays and Sundays. And all of those things are for tournaments to make money, for kids to buy uniforms and balls and bats. And so we want you just to have that information because we are in the middle of negotiations and we're trying to get a three-year deal. We've actually been without a contract this year, which we agreed to, to move forward. And we want to be a, a good partner with this district. And we think we are. And we think that in terms of making this a destination district, your frontline leaders need to be a priority. There's 148 of us that make this district go every day, along with our hardworking teachers and staff. But I just wanted you to have that information that a 14th year teacher is making more per hour if they're in D or E than the principals are at an elementary school. Thank you for your time. Thank you. District Parent Advisory Committees, the CAC. Come on down. And thank you for your patience tonight. Hello. Howdy. I'm Angie Sutherland. I'm the chair of the Community Advisory Committee. And we have some updates for you. Uh, the first being um, that we really appreciate um, members Pritchett and Vang coming to our CAC special meeting and gathering our input on what we feel are the desired qualities of a new superintendent. Um, just to highlight a few of those, we had a really long, detailed conversation, but um, we would like someone who, with strong and proven leadership in systems change, the ability to significantly improve educational services and outcomes for students with disabilities, and the ability to raise the bar for students with disabilities to where it should be. Ability to bring togetherness by building connections with parents and teachers. Ability to influence culture change to significantly improve campus culture and the inclusion of students with disabilities. So those were the sort of the summaries, I guess, or the themes of, of what we discussed. Uh, we'd also like to talk to you about some ideas we have for parent engagement. So I'll let Benita Ayala, our vice chair, kind of put in a request. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. We had um, this week our first opportunity that we started is a called a parent chat, 
We had one on April 3rd, which is at, uh, it was from 10.30 to 11.30 at the Espresso Metro, that's next to Sac City. And then we also had one that Angie Affili uh, uh, did on Tuesday, which was from 6 to 8.30. And what we were trying to do is to be proactive as far as with our parents that come in so they can have experience to speak to other parents that have actually been through it. And to be totally honest with you is to put in a pitch to, to show how they can maneuver through Sac City and hopefully to make it to a positive ad, positive adventure so they won't come up to maybe here and have a negative experience. So we had a new parent that came in and her child was is two, was diagnosed at 18 months. And what touched me about that is that she was around a group of parents of all different ages. My son was the oldest and there was some other ones there and her young son was with her. Um, and she was hesitant to be there. She was hesitant as far as the questions that she asked. But the phenomenal thing that happened is that she happened to put her son down. She got to see the community of what she was going to be surrounded by. Her son got down on the ground and decided he wanted to crawl underneath the table. Whereas parents, what we do is we figure we huddle in because we're a community and we're a family. So he decided he was going to be clever and climb underneath the parent and go under because he wanted to run off and around the coffee shop to pull things down. Lo and behold, when he came out from underneath, he realized that parent was standing there, and he looked at her and just fell out, you know? But what was nice to see is the other parent, how her shoulders just dropped. Like, wow, this is how it works. And the reason why I tell that story is because that's what I want her to have that experience when she's entered into Sac City. It's like, wow, this is how it works. Because if you have that, then you're going to have that community of parents that's going to go out because we're the ones that's going to say that this school or this 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 district rocks it's it's what, what matters is us to be honest with you when the word of mouth when you go to macy's or whatever what happens it's a word of mouth that people give you they think man i'm going to go there well if you want that that word of mouth is what you need so what i'm suggesting is that when you guys are out there support us in doing that we're going to plan to do it every month we do it at our own free time to do this. Angie and I are the ones that are sacrificing to do that. We realized it was important because we didn't have it. And I think that if we would have it, you know, things might have been a lot more differently. I might have been a nicer, more parent coming in my journey. Um, <laughs> but in the meantime, it still made me a better parent. But what she got to realize is, wow, she, her pain and journey might not be as difficult as ours because of the fact. So my pitch is, is that you guys would support us as we continue on with this to empower more parents. It's not just the new ones that have to come. We want all of them. But it's the new ones that we can grasp to make it a little bit more easier. So thank you for listening. Thank you. And we've listed our uh, Benita and my uh, phone numbers so that you can refer parents that you encounter to us. And we also have a special request from the board. Um, I don't know if this is possible, but if the uh, meeting minutes could be a little bit more specific on s kind of summarizing what the comments are that, that parents come up here and make or that our CAC comes up here or the other parent groups and even um, the, the unions, if you could list some bullet points of what was discussed. The reason I'm saying this is that will help increase engagement people will see these minutes and, and know what we're working on, and maybe they'll want to get more involved. So um, a lot of people don't even know we or these other groups exist, um, and so they don't know about our website or our Facebook page, but they do know the board, uh, well, some. It's one extra place they can look. Um, I'll try to be brief on these last um, couple items, but... We would like to invite you to our April 24th meeting, and we will be having a panel on dyslexia policy um, and it, the relation of the uh, district uh, board resolution that we had passed. So we would, yes? Is it the 25th? I'm sorry. It's April 25th, Tuesday, 6.30 to 8.30. Thank you for that. Um, is so we, it here at CERNA? It's here at CERNA. We have uh, child care and we also have Spanish translation and 
Translation can also be requested in additional languages. If somebody calls me within two days before the meeting or they call the district to make that happen. Um, the last item is just to follow up on the questions that we've asked over the last few meetings. It's just a summary of what those were. I looked on the, um, the board website. I didn't see any responses um, to public comment. Um, is that on there? You said it was being added. Elliot? Yeah, our, our web team is, is currently working on that, so okay. we did take note of that comment at the last board meeting, and it's in their queue. They're working on that right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, well, as the CAC advises the, um, the governing school board and the SELPA, you're free to also get back to us um, and not, you know, if you want to email us or, or send us a letter or, or talk to us, that'd be great. So we'd like to know if the special ed audit is being completed and when will that be available. Um, we have questions about the MTSS, um, which I spoke to Dr. Taylor about a little bit. And then we also would like to recommend that you guys host a or have a um, board workshop on students with disabilities to learn more about how they're being educated, the demographics, placement, um, outcomes, services, and funding. And then um, just to follow up on the plans for the board resolutions that we had passed and, and how those we would like to help uh, with the implementation on those. So I'm very sorry for the long comment, and thank you for listening. No problem. Uh, Member Cochran. Stay for just a minute. Just very briefly, uh, the work that the Community Advisory Committee does is quite sophisticated, and I'd like to thank publicly uh, CAC for sharing the template for your brochure about you and your activities, and we hope to steal a lot more from you for DLAC. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Member Ryan. And I just wanted to thank Angie and Benita. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to thank Angie and Benita for your comments tonight, as always. Um, so nice to see you, Benita. It's been a while. We've missed you at the board meetings. Um, so one thing that we have in queue that might address some of your concerns about the level of detail in response to um, both the reports by the CAC and others um, is that right now we're currently looking at working with our technology department, being able to break up our agenda items on our video by agenda item. That way, because right now our meeting minutes are already much longer than the average board meeting minute, and you know as well as anyone, as a parent, it's hard to comb through all of that. But if we can actually click on individual agenda items and video, it's a very good way to see the updates from, from board meeting to board meeting. Thank you. That's amazing. And also, you guys are one of the very few boards or our district that actually televises the meetings and has them on YouTube. So um, it's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Member Pritchett. Thank you. I just wanted to um, uh, talk about what uh, Member Ryan had just spoke about. This is something that um, I have actually met with um, Nathaniel, our board assistant, and our previous board secretary about um, and if you go to the city council's website, they have that type of system. So we will be looking into that. Um, if you can, they'll have the person's name and you can click on that name and then it'll just play that two minute clip, right? And then their meeting minutes are very, um, a lot smaller because then it just has bullets of like, this is, you know, this person spoke. So we're hoping to be able to get that going soon. Thank you. It, it's going to take some time, I'm sure. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. District English Learner Advisory Committee, DLAC. Okay. Uh, gifted and Gate Indian Education. All right. Superintendent's report. Thank you, President Hansen. I want to remind parents that we have our last two summer matters information nights scheduled for April 17th and April the 21st here at the Cerna Center. Drop in any time between 4 and 7 p.m. where uh, parents can learn about different summer opportunities to help uh, keep learning a priority during the long summer break. Parents will also be able to register their students at that time. For more information, 
visit our, our youth development website. Um, and just so you know, we've held three previous information nights already. As many of you know, the district and health organizations hold a popular annual Healthy Kids Day every year. Our 17th uh, Healthy Kids Day is May the 6th at the Golden One Center downtown. Families can enroll in health insurance plans and receive free health services. Yesterday's eConnection has a flyer and a link to information about the May 6th event. Graduation season is right around the corner. Our graduation schedule is now posted on the website. Uh, I want you to save the date for our first Sacramento Unified Education Foundation Teacher Appreciation Gala for Inspiring Teachers, which is scheduled for Thursday, May 18th from 5.30 to 9 p.m. at the Sacramento Memorial Auditorium. Proceeds from the benefit will be used to support students and student activities. For more information about the Foundation's work, visit sacedfoundation.org. Congratulations to West Campus Girls Varsity Basketball Team for winning the CIF State Championships. A tremendous achievement. Great game. We also can't forget the girls basketball team from C.K. McClatchy for their fine finish as runner-ups in the state tournament as well. Congratulations to both teams, their coaches, and the schools. Uh, I also want to congratulate Albert Einstein's uh, coach, Dwight Taylor, who was recently selected as Sacramento Kings Choice as their pick for Junior NBA Coach of the Year. Congratulations to him. This wraps up my report for the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, a lot of stuff happening uh, in the district. Uh, in particular, we uh, started our uh, supervis uh, the superintendent search. Uh, we had an amazing uh, 28 applications. I think uh, a lot of folk, the folks that we had, uh, were working with said that was a reflection on the strength of the district and the desirability of coming to this district, that people view it as a stable, positive place to work. We're very excited about that. This Sunday we'll be doing our final uh, interviews, uh, and for the first time in kind of uh, unprecedented district transparency, we'll be having a community advisory panel as part of the interviews for the superintendents. Uh, we've invited people from the community uh, and our employee organizations to participate in that, and their evaluations will be part of our decision making. Um, and from the city, uh, Mayor Steinberg will also be joining us uh, reflecting the growing partnership that we've got with the city of Sacramento, which I think uh, continues to be very positive for the district. And I'll, I'll just stop there. So I'll save the rest for uh, information sharing on board. So let me go to Member Rosas. Thank you, President Hansen. I am happy to share that on Wednesday, March 22nd, Student Advisory Council led a superintendent search community meeting for students uh, led by, uh, by students here in the Cerna Center. This was Student Advisory Council's third uh, student-led meeting concerning the superintendent search. It resulted in fantastic and really much needed input by students. I am actually uh, really excited because I'm part part of uh, the superintendent search committee and I will be on the interviewing panel and I believe this is the first time that a student school board member has been uh, in that process so um, I'm very I, I understand the importance of it and I'm very excited for the interviews that are going to come up and I'm talking and I'm communicating with SAC uh, to make sure that I'm doing the best job that I can to accurately represent the students because it's a really big choice and um, I, I'm, I'm excited for it. Um, so also I'm currently working with board member Michael Minnick right now and student and with the Student Advisory Council to figure out ways to further enhance student uh, input in LCAP. And uh, we are also, SAC is currently working on applications for the next Student Advisory Board. Right now we're um, looking in over applications, but actually uh, it's still open for applicants. So to members who are, to audience members who are here or at home watching, uh, board members and anybody who thinks that they they know students or if you are a student and you are interested in applying, feel free to email me at 
uh, natalie-rosas at uh, scusd.edu, uh, and I'd be happy to talk to the students um, in person, over the phone, and really kind of talk to them about the application process and uh, what things to expect and, and kind of um, how it goes on. So please share that information, um, and I'd be happy to talk to any students who are interested in being involved in Student Advisory Council. Also, um, I've been talking to some students, and we're really excited because on um, there's a pilot program going on in McClatchy with the um, College and Career uh, Development Center. It's a pilot program that will work on um, career readiness. Uh, I, career readiness for students, um, and it's going to be a pilot program, but hopefully after that it extends onto more campuses, and it's it's nice to see that more opportunities are being presented to students. But um, that's all I have to share for today. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, at this time, we're going to go to um, board member sharing. Looks like we have Trustee Myvang. Awesome. So I'll I'll keep this short because I know it's nine ten, um, and we have cool ten minutes. But I'm going to try to keep this in two. So um, <laughs> first thing is um, I so it's been officially hundred and ten days since I've um, you know been elected to school board and sitting in the seat. And I really just want to take this opportunity to thank all the teachers. Um, the principals, the parents, and students for welcoming onto welcoming me to their campus. Um, I have 16 schools in my area. I'm almost done. I have two more left to go. Um, but I just really wanted to take this opportunity to make this to make a public comment to make this public um, that I I just really appreciate um, you know all of our teachers and and our parents and all of our staff that's working hard every day at the front lines, really serving our students. I think. For me, as a school board member, it really keeps me grounded to really continue to see the challenges that are facing our students in the classroom. But at the same time, I think there's so many great things happening at our school site um, that we don't really share. Um, I know Cesar Chavez has a great uh, Latino cinema program. John Still has an amazing um, visual uh, performing arts program um, that we don't talk much about. But there's a lot of great things happening in the schools. And I just you know, want to just to, to say thank you to all the schools for all your hard work. Um, and that I look forward to, you know, really for the next four year um, to advocate for each and every one of you. The second thing I wanted to announce um, is that the executive committee um, and President Hansen also appointed me to uh, the City of Sacramento Safe Haven Task Force. Um, right now, the City of Sacramento is working on their resolution on what a sanctuary city looks like, and I'm working really close. I'm working closely with them, and also uh, Trustee Jesse Ryan, Ryan, in ensuring that um, as the city moves forward with a Safe Haven Task Force and their own resolution, and that we're in coordination uh, because right now they're looking for funding from the city actually to coordinate uh, legal services for residents in the city. And I think that needs to be done in coordination with the work that we're also doing at the school district. So I also just wanted to uh, report back regarding um, that appointment. Thank you, Maya. I appreciate that. Are there any other comments from board members? It looks like we have one from board member Wu. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Uh, I just wanted to announce happily uh, on behalf of Comcast and Comcast Cares, which is uh, coming up on April 22nd, that they this year have selected West Campus to help spruce up. I don't know what the specific projects are, but you can go to um, um, the Comcast, uh, www.comcastinthecommunity.com if you want to sign up to volunteer to help on that project. I've um, participated in some of the other Comcast Cares, and I'm so proud that they at least uh, have several times selected schools in the Sac City Unified School District, and it really has made a difference to the children who attend those schools. So thank you. Thank you, Board Member Wu. Board Member Minnick? Just to, uh, to give uh, Member Wu some, some background, the um, project that they're working on right now is they've replaced the uh, grass field in front of the school, well, it's not a field, the grass kind of lawn in front of the school with a, they're creating a water-wise, uh, uh, drought-friendly uh, um, uh, garden, uh, as well as some other things around campus. So there's some pretty exciting uh, um, upgrades going on. So you can actually drive by right now and see a lot of dirt 
um, where there used to be grass. Wonderful. I have a few quick updates um, to keep it under the 10 minute limit for all of us combined. Um, so I'm going to just share um, one thing. I had an opportunity to participate in the spring feast last week. I want to give huge kudos to our school nutritions department that did a phenomenal job of hosting a meal that included um, very good sliced ham, some rolls, but really I think more importantly, locally sourced fruits and vegetables, including sugar snap peas, spinach, some wonderful berries, and frankly, I was amazed at so many young students gobbling up their fruits and vegetables as a result of the beautiful presentation and the really delicious salad bar that was at each and every one of our school sites. Um, I want to plug our school wellness policy update as part of sharing that spring feast. So as you know, we are in the process of revising our school wellness policy, which hasn't been done for many years. I would like to encourage those of you in the audience and watching and um, those of you who also are active at the school site level to encourage your parents and community members to go on the district website at www.scusd.edu and type in coordinated school health committee, which will allow you access to the survey. It's extremely important that we hear your voices as we update these policies so that our schools have the appropriate guidance to make sure that as we're growing our students' minds, we're also growing healthy bodies. And then two quick other updates. I wanted to share that thanks to the generous support of board member Pritchett and others, we have successfully now completed our SHINE program at five of our six school sites. You'll recall SHINE was our initiative to empower middle school young women through the principles of strength, wisdom, and purpose. It was remarkable going to the graduation at Pacific Elementary earlier this week to see 100 young women. This was the largest number that they've served to date. They usually serve about 50 per school site in tears because for many of them, it was the first time over the eight-week program that they had been told that they were valuable that they were important, that they were going to contribute great things to the world. And we heard from young ladies who pulled us aside and shared that prior to the SHINE program, they had felt worthless. A few had even admitted to wanting to commit suicide or do self-harm. And now they felt like they had a family, a continuum of women who were supporting them. So I'm hoping that we will get the um, financial resources to scale that at our high poverty schools. And then finally, I'm very proud to say and, and thank the board members for our work around Safe Haven School District. Earlier this week, we had the tremendous honor of having Superintendent Tom Torlickson visit Oak Ridge Elementary School and present SAC City Unified with a seal, the Safe Haven seal, and a special certificate of recognition. He acknowledged that our Safe Haven effort has been the pilot and the impetus for Safe Haven work that he has pushed for all schools across the state. We now have 60 districts that follow following our model resolution have adopted the safe haven and many more that are looking to us for the implementation work on the ground. Superintendent Torlickson said that he's going to steal our pledge card. He loved the pledge card that we've been distributing to educators, families, and students across the district and he's going to take that and also encourage that at scale. Um, I also had an opportunity to present at CFT on our safe haven work where we heard from educators across the state, teachers who are really the ground warriors day in, day out, who are dealing with students who are experiencing trauma and fear of deportation. And the resources that were shared and the honest conversation that was had was pretty remarkable, but it just goes to show that we have so much more work to do um, as this is just the beginning of this effort. So um, finally, as part of that, I want to share our seal of approval from Superintendent Tom Torlickson. So we were given this with the special certificate from the California Department of Education. And I would love to request that this be hung somewhere outside the district office 
or in the hall to designate our commitment and our priority to being a safe haven, a welcoming space for all students and families. Thank you very much, Member Pritchett. I just have a follow-up question for Member Ryan. Um, in regards to the school wellness policy, do you have a timeline when that will be brought to the board? Um, yes, we're hoping to be able to bring it to the board for a vote in late May. Late May, okay. And then will we, 1st oh, of June? 1st of June. Oh, yes, um, we canceled the, the board meeting in May so that we can accommodate the Sac City Unified School Foundation um, annual fundraiser, so it will be the first meeting in May, in, in June. Okay, and will we have an opportunity to review that um, and maybe uh, some um, community meetings prior to that that you know of? The reason why I'm asking is I've heard some concerns from the, um, from the community about um, possibly some of the items that will be placed into the policy about selling um, sugary foods at games, which is a, a big fundraiser, as you can imagine, at football games, soccer games, baseball games basketball. I don't want to leave yeah. anybody out. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so we have had a um, work group that's been working on the policy for the last year and a half comprised of internal and external community stakeholders. But I'm more than happy to, in addition to the work group's work and the work that we've done through the survey, host a, a community meeting or two. I think it's a great idea. Um, and frankly, I have been encouraging our parents to take the time to fill out the survey because I don't know about you in the audience, but I hear almost on a weekly basis from parents who are unhappy with how sugary treats are being doled out or the lack of um, a wellness policy. And so it really is an opportunity to make your voices heard and ensure that your kids have an opportunity to eat healthy foods on a regular basis. Sure, I completely agree. I just want to make sure that we're not uh, restricting schools from raising funds. So um, I'd be happy to have an offline conversation with you about that as well. Member Ryan, your light's still on. You have any? Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Just a quick couple board shout outs for me. The Food Literacy Center is doing a series of events this week through next week. So uh, it's an opportunity to support them. Um, and those will be very interesting. And then what a great opportunity to go to Golden One uh, Center to go see the McClatchy women's team and uh, West Campus uh, girls play too. That was just a remarkable opportunity. And it's fun to have it here in our backyard. So that was very fun. Uh, board committee reports. Am I calling any of the yeah. chairs? We had extensive facilities. Maybe academic <laughs> committee. Sure. I just wanted to um, let folks know that we met uh, last week, discussed uh, the current arts and music programs in our district. We're having discussions about how to move forward so that, um, you know, move toward the idea that every student in our district has um, some level of exposure to the arts and how we can do that, you know, quickly and, and efficiently and inexpensively, at least in the short term. Um, so those discussions are going on. Um, our next meeting is going to be May 1st at 1.30 p.m., um, the we're rotating around school, so we don't have a location at this point, um, but it will be posted um, so that folks can uh, come out. Thank you. And member Ryan. We have our policy. We have our policy committee tomorrow, so I have no update at this time. Wonderful. Member Wu. Thank you, President. Hanson. So um, Monday, the Budget Committee met. We had a fairly robust discussion on um, trying to, uh, on uh, school site councils and how they could um, uh, get more involvement with the uh, interest and involvement with parents. And we're um, going to continue that discussion. We had um, a report from our staff uh, on uh, the comp composition and purpose of school site councils, and we will continue that to the next um, 
next budget committee meeting in May. Thank you. Member Cochran, would you like to report out on the superintendent? Well, surely. Uh, it's, it's very exciting. On Sunday, we will be conducting interviews with the community partners panel and the board. Uh, we have uh, five uh, people that we are interviewing, and uh, we hope to have a result by the end of Sunday. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. Item 12. Point one is the new uh, technology services update. Thank you for your patience. Uh, let me call up Elliot and Rachel and our student member who was and, joining us. Thank and you. as they come up, I also really want to thank uh, the teacher, Kevin Hubble, who's a fourth, four five combo teacher at Isidore Cohen. And I really want to thank Taylor Elliot, fifth grader, who's been so patient tonight. We're really sorry about the lateness of the hour, but we're looking forward to the presentation. Good evening. Good evening, Board President Hanson, Board Members, and Superintendent Bonda. Uh, my name is Elliot Lopez, Chief Information <clears throat> Officer, and I'm here tonight with Rachel Cooper, Coordinator of Instructional Technology. We also are lucky to have with us tonight Ms. Kevin Hubble, who is a teacher at Isidore Cohen Elementary. And with her is her fifth grade pupil and uh, perhaps future district CIO, uh, Ms. Taylor Elliott. Thank you for sticking it out. Tonight we will present an update on the great work being performed in the area of instructional technology across the district. We will talk this evening about the progress we're making and the impact that technology is having on teaching and learning in our classrooms. You'll be hearing directly from our school leaders and teachers about the change that is taking place in our district. And then we will share some of our future goals and areas of focus. We believe in partnering with leaders across the district to improve instruction. And to that end, we are building an environment that supports innovation in the classroom and provides resources that prepare students for college, work, and life. As it is outside of K-12, technology is a pervasive influence driving change across every facet of education. Unfortunately, our district has not historically maintained the pace of technological change seen in other districts, but we have made tremendous strides towards closing the gap. Today, we provide access to dynamic content that increases student engagement, materials that allows teachers to differentiate instruction for classrooms of diverse learners, devices that enable students to create, collaborate, and communicate with each other, and software and apps that extend learning beyond the school campus and school day. Let's hear directly from teachers and school administrators about the impacts of technology on teaching and learning in our classrooms right now. Having all of the kids on Google Drive has been abundantly helpful. Um, I feel like I can monitor and assess their work way quicker with more meaning, I can give uh, better feedback um, earlier on and they can edit and revise their work as they go, just being on a shared document and not waiting for the back and forth. And I think that their presentation skills have increased and I think that that's been really neat to see because the skills that a student may or may not have in a traditional classroom setting might not apply in terms of their um, proficiency with technology and so it has allowed for greater collaboration and greater confidence building among the kids and that's been cool. Utilizing technology in the classroom with gone one-to-one -one, um, provides an opportunity and an avenue for them to self-express in ways that they may not have done otherwise. We have um, pen pals at other school sites. So for example, the, the teacher at Crocker and I um, have created a couple documents that we've shared, shared with our students and then students can collaborate with students off campus in a secure manner. 
it's just adding a whole other dimension to the learning that's taking place. And especially here, uh, you know, our, our kids are phenomenal and our teachers and our students are creating some amazing things in the classroom. And with the added support of the technology or the use of the technology, it's just, it's added another dimension between even the relationships between the teachers and the students. Because sometimes it is the students teaching the teachers with the technology piece and it's learning from each other and it, it's a beautiful thing in the classroom. This is something that they know is the future. It is not just the future, it is right now. And so I have almost no discipline problems as a result. Um, because they are engaged with something that most of them don't have at home. We have to have technology for certain things on campus and we believe that if it's done well, it can actually enhance educational experience for kids. Um, well, I think from the, from the beginning, our school was designated as a STEAM school in our reopening this year. And so from day one, we've been about one-to-one -one technology, um, and that was going to be one of our drivers in teaching and learning. We always seek input from our families and our teachers as well. And one of the things that's always been there is technology. Um, we hear from you know, parents and guardians. You know, we want to make sure our students can access technology in the classroom. Our teachers see it as well. They're learning on their own. You know, they if they're they're able to look things up. They use the, the you know the computers, the technology to create, to build, and it's hands on. And so again, it's making them take their learning uh, to another level. I think also. It allows them to be a global citizen. They are seeing videos and articles and pictures from all over the world, and it allows them to build empathy and perspective, and I think that that's really neat too. and administrators at Caleb Greenwood, Leah Tata Floyd, Oak Ridge, Washington, Luther Burbank, West Campus, and JFK, not just for making themselves available on short notice to be interviewed for this video, but also for being innovators at their schools and in their classrooms. The work they do each day helps to guide us as a district and inform the decisions and the direction that we support. And there are many more teachers doing incredible things with technology than we could possibly represent in this three minute video. We want to acknowledge those efforts as well. To support this amazing shift taking place, we have been hard at work building infrastructure and establishing new standards to maximize the use of technology. Over the past two years, we have upgraded wired and wireless networks at almost every school. And this summer, we are going back out to 20 schools to further enhance our network. We are also working to increase speeds to the internet tenfold, alleviating bottlenecks and building capacity for the many resources and applications we offer. In the classroom, we have begun to deploy technology that allows teachers and students to wireless, wirelessly display images from their computers onto large mobile screens, enabling teachers to step away from the front of the classroom and to use their space more flexibly. We have facilitated the deployment of digital media studios at eight schools, and this year, 37 submissions of student-produced films are being considered for the Sacramento Educational Video Awards on April 19th. Working with principals, we also recently established new student device standards and have rolled out almost 8,000 student Chromebooks since June of 2016, with several schools at or approaching one-to-one -one student device ratios. In addition, we have launched a new computer replacement program so that teachers at participating schools will always have reliable and robust technology available. This program allows schools to stretch their dollars by amortizing purchase costs over the five-year cycle. In the first pilot year of the program, over 250 new computers were deployed to teachers across the district. We are working with many principals interested in enrolling their schools in the coming year. All of this work and infrastructure exists for the ultimate purpose of providing our students with the highest quality education possible. To that end, we are the, 
we are proudest of the strides we have made to deploy engaging and effective instructional resources across the district. At the start of the school year, we provided for the first time a centralized account to every student in the district. Under a single sign-on system, this account unlocks access to resources like G Suite for Education, which supports student collaboration through a suite of web-based tools, formative assessment resources like iReady and Illuminate, online textbook materials that expand the breadth and depth of content available to our students, supplemental resources and interventions, and a host of online applications like Khan Academy with thousands of free lessons and video tutorials, Code.org, a leading source of computer science instruction, and Open eBooks, which provides access to thousands of free library books online. We collaborate with our colleagues in the academic office and at schools in the review and selection of instructional applications intended for use in our classrooms, evaluating these resources and their providers for viability, efficacy, and security. And to protect our students, we established a protocol ensuring that any vendor or third party that provides student accounts or services or who might ever possess student data or protected information conform to our strict requirements for ensuring the security of that information. Over 7,500 student logins to technology-based instructional resources take place every school day, and the number continues to grow steadily. Successful integration of technology in the classroom is about more than just making resources available. Over the past two years, we have conducted professional learning sessions to help teachers use technology to enhance their instruction and engage students. Since August of 2015, over 1,100 teachers and staff have learned best practices for using G Suite for Education to differentiate instruction, collaborate with colleagues, deliver math and ELA instruction, and facilitate digital book clubs. As you heard from our teachers and administrators in this video, tools like G Suite are changing the practice of instruction in our classrooms. In addition, we were invited by schools and teachers to participate in collaborative time every Thursday afternoon throughout the year, reaching over 420 teachers. We also wanted to ensure that our district administrators and office staff were leveraging these powerful tools. We have worked with teams in the academic office, human resources, and finance departments to integrate technology into their processes to improve efficiency. And we provided formal training to over 120 classified staff. Technology is constantly changing and professional learning is an ongoing process. We will continue to focus in this area so that the district benefits from the resources. Let's hear about one teacher's journey through technology and the impact she is having on her students. I'd like to introduce Mrs. Kevin Hubble. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, good evening, uh, Board President um, Hansen, Board members, and Superintendent Banda. My name is Kevin Hubble, and being a GATE teacher at Isidore Cohen Elementary, I've always known that technology needed to be a high priority in my classroom. I began several years ago using Google Carts and, uh, to engage my students and have them present their work electronically. Last year, I applied to attend the Summer Math Institute as they were offering three classroom teachers the chance to have a Chromebook cart in their classroom. We were introduced to the Chromebooks and Google Docs at the SMI, so I took several more professional learning opportunities over the summer that Rachel um, Cooper facilitated. Since getting the card in my classroom, we've been using Google Docs, Google Forms, Slides, and even Google Hangout to enhance my teaching and our classroom learning. One of the successes that I'm most proud of in my classroom is the ability of my students to research and present great lessons to their classmates. We are doing a play called The American Revolution, and there are several references to many of the key points of the revolution. Rather than me teaching all the points, my students chose partners, chose a topic from the play, and created a Google slide presentation with lots of other stuff in it to um, share with their fellow students. After each presentation, the students have a reflection sheet that they complete and explain what they've learned from their fellow students. To watch what the students come up with in their lessons makes me enjoy teaching even more. Uh, it's amazing to see what they can do. I've been so excited this year creating lessons, watching the students complete them, and then having them help me adjust the lessons that we find when we find things that, we, that work better. Probably the biggest change in my classroom this year has been the amount of paper that I don't use. 
we, um, most of my assignments are shared with my students electronically. They make a copy and then link it back to me for grading. I've been able to create Google Doc links for both ELA, science, social studies, and math. And I'm excited that my students and I can share our work electronically. Thank you. All right, now for the, the big finale. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Taylor Elliott, and I am a student in Ms. Hubble's class at Isidore Cohen. Before there were any computers in my classroom, there was just a paper and pencil to write with. Now that technology has been introduced into my classroom, it has been much easier to submit work and write my own thoughts that might come to mind. Now I finally get to practice most of my typing skills and get work done much faster. Otherwise, computers are really simple to work with once you get a hang of it. The best part of using Google Apps in the classroom is that they are very fun and easy to learn about once you see them. It takes, makes more tasks easier to complete and get to. When you get to Google Apps, they are fun to mess around with and see what other cool features that they might do. In the classroom, Google Apps help my classmates interact with social learning and academic language and reading and math comprehension, which is the fun part of it all. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. So have you, as you've heard tonight, teachers and students across the district are enthusiastically embracing technology in diverse ways. In the future, we will continue to prioritize the work that supports innovation for our students and teachers. Our next steps include the development of a technology plan that aligns to our district's strategy and goals. We also have to be mindful of the diverse needs of our students and the impact of disparate access to technology outside of our school walls. A key challenge for our district as we further the use of computers by our students will be ensuring that they have equal access to the wealth of instructional resources we provide from both the classroom and at home. Finally, we will continue to partner across the district to advise on and to promote the adoption of digital curriculum and computer science instruction to explore innovative school design and instructional delivery models and to champion the advancement of teaching and learning whenever and wherever possible. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Member Minnick. Uh, Member Pritchett. Oh, any public comment? We have one public comment, Darlene Anderson. Thank you. Darlene Anderson, come on down. Good evening. I do know that the Google Tech uh, Docs and how that worked at SES and how it really supported my student, but I don't know how it works at John F. Kennedy High School if it's just a certain group of kids, because I don't believe it's all kids. I would like to know that, you know, in the single plan for student achievement, that you could see these things, how they affected all students. And I, you can't read that. It doesn't affect all students. And then when you go to the schools, you can see all students don't have access. We're really talking about access to the public educational system. We have tiered school services. We have some kids who are in gate classes. They have access to all the resources. We have some kids who are in SD classes who have Z-coded curriculum. And Z-coded curriculum doesn't carry the same weight as regular curriculum. And they're not going to college. In Sacramento, we are responsible for all these people because we all have to deal with them on the streets. We need to really build up our school site councils. When I was uh, the, the DAC chair, we had almost 81 schools participating. And from that time that I left, it kind of dwindled down. And then it went away. We have the LCAP committee where you get to choose a person that represents, but we elect you from areas. And then we are eliminated participation 
because you select two or three people. And then when you have community meetings, you have very little or no turnout. It's important that we have a sound system that works for all children. And if we're going to use technology in one place, we need to figure out and get a response from the school sites how they're developing those services for all children so we can ensure that all kids are engaged. Right now, we don't have that. And I would hope the board would ensure that their administrators are working on how to get technology down to all children. Thank you. Thank you. Member Pritchard. Thank you. First, I want to thank you for having this on the agenda. I know that I have requested it. So um, I do have several questions. Um, first off, um, can you just um, elaborate? <laughs> You're trying to figure out where to stand. <laughs> Uh, can you just elaborate a little bit on our internet and the services that we currently use? Because as you know, I send many of the complaints that I'm hearing your way. And I know that you guys have been working. And let's just talk specifically Einstein, because that's probably been the biggest one so far. So I know that they are they try to work on things like um, YouTube or posting to YouTube um, for study purposes. And the system's just not allowing it. Sure, thank you, um, Board Member Pritchett, um, for sending that yeah. feedback. I, we don't consider them complaints. We appreciate the information because it helps us to understand um, how our systems are functioning. Uh, in this case, um, what we're finding is that we're a little bit of a victim of our own success uh, in that the adoption of the, of the services it has been tremendous and that we have a capacity issue with uh, connectivity. Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, this evening, uh, the board it has approved a uh, critical upgrade that will, in fact, alleviate the bottleneck that's causing some of the issues that you're referring to right now. And so uh, we're aware of it, and we're on it, and, uh, and we plan on, our, on correcting that particular issue to make more of these resources um, available to our schools. So it was my understanding that the original problem was not that it, that it had something to do with the carrier. It was blocking the site. Is that correct? Um, I'm not certain about which specific uh, issue you're referring to. Um, it, we we only we so as a school district, we're required to inspect all network traffic and to ensure that it complies with Ed Code for uh, for safety for our students, um, and so that. That results in some services and resources being blocked. Generally, for those types of things, we receive requests from schools to unblock them. And if they have uh, uh, educational merit, uh, more often than not, we will unblock them expeditiously. So uh, typically what happens is that the filters that, that block these services and resources, they have some automated intelligence built into them that is miscategorizing or misclassifying these resources and blocking them. We're not aware of that until we hear about it. Um, and when we hear about it, we unblock them. Uh, it, one, the other issue that we're hearing is that uh, things are just sort of moving slowly out there. And that is directly related to a capacity limitation, which we are looking to alleviate by upgrading infrastructure uh, to increase bandwidth. So I, I find it interesting that you're saying that they could just call on you and block it because this has been an ongoing issue at Einstein and it's been happening probably over the past year and a half and I know I've been talking to you about it and I, it seemed like there was always a reason why they weren't able to use the program that they were using. I'm happy to talk about it offline. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly which resource you're referring to but if it is an instructional application that doesn't pose any risk to our students there's no reason that we would explicitly block it. Yeah, I think it would be smart for us to have a conversation offline um, because I know I had just recently sent you an email from a, a teacher that, do you know what I'm talking about? I, I do not. I do not. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. I, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I think, oh, so, okay, Rachel just reminded me. If you know which one I'm talking about? If it's about? regarding okay. the yearbook, yes. We actually just yeah. visited Einstein and spoke with that teacher directly uh -huh. and, uh, and uh, met with her in her classroom and observed the function of this application in the classroom. And that's not, that is directly correlated to um, the limitation of capacity because in that particular case, what the students are doing is trying to complete the yearbook and uploading 
large volumes of, uh, of photos and that's causing um, some slowness and she has obviously a limited amount of time in, in which to complete that exercise and that's causing some issues with the class. So I'm, gonna, so I'm throwing my pen around. I'm going to ask you something in layman's terms because sure. I'm not, I, I don't understand the World Wide Web in detail. But so at, um, at a school site, do they have their own server where they're like, for example, they're getting on, there's a lot of people getting on, it's starting to bog down the system, right? And it's, is that just school site? Based no, or is on district not. based? So, so uh, without going into too much detail, the, the way that our network is structured in particular because we do have to make sure that we inspect all of the data that, goes, that comes and goes to and from the district, the primary connection to the internet channels through this, the district, the district office. All of the schools connect to the district office. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is that when there's a lot of traffic at the schools, um, that, that traffic, um, uh, co you know, aggregates here at the district level and it overwhelms our connection to the, to the internet. And that is the particular bottleneck that we are in fact addressing with the hardware upgrade that was approved today. And so does it also, um, have to do with, uh, the equipment that's at the school sites and like some school sites might have newer equipment, some school sites might have less of newer equipment. And that may affect their them being slow. From from an infrastructure perspective, that is not um, that is not a factor here. This is purely a supply and demand issue. We have uh, we just don't have enough capacity right now, and we're trying to increase the capacity so that our school sites can get out to the web <laughs> and access the resources that they're looking to connect to. So some of the feedback that I've heard um, has to do with us using iCloud. Is that a problem that we're currently having? And, or do we not have enough bandwidth? It's, it's, it all relates to capacity. Uh, so uh, folks are using iCloud and Google Apps and lots of instructional applications and other services. And uh, so there's not one particular service or resource that is being limited or filtered in any way. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a function of, um, of supply and demand right now. So what do we do to fix that? So what we're doing is we're buying uh, hardware that will increase our capacity to connect to the internet tenfold. Um, and uh, and you know once that hardware comes in, we upgrade and the flow of traffic is alleviated. I'm happy to hear that because I, I mean I don't I think it's uh, no surprise to anyone in this room that we're at the t today's age of computer technology and everybody's getting on. That's going to be the new way of doing everything. Absolutely. So, or yes. is the new way of doing everything. Um, so can you tell me, um, I've also heard some just rumblings about our new library scanning system that was implemented. And um, I, first off, you, I want to talk to you about like kind of a two-part question, like how efficient is this and um, what um, steps did you take to engage the librarians and the school sites to make sure that it's efficient? Uh, I think you're referring to our library and textbook management software upgrade mm -hmm. that's taking place right now. It's a product called Fall at Destiny. It's essentially the industry standard in K-12 and um, we're in the process of moving off of obsoleted software. Uh, so this is essentially a mandatory upgrade for us. Um, the, the, the software is already in use um, in parts of the district. Uh, what we did is we moved it to a cloud-hosted uh, version of the software that is um, that in the process of uh, transitioning our schools to this version of the application is being subjected to some of these slowdowns because that software is actually out on the internet. So as our staff are moving our uh, asset collections, our libraries and our textbook collections onto the new version of the software, staff are experiencing some slowdown, some delays in that migration process. So that too will be alleviated by this uh, bottleneck um, correction that we're uh, that we're planning to take place in the next couple of weeks. Isn't that um, a computer program that could be solo on one computer rather than being on the cloud and bogging down the system? No, Follett 
so Follett is a, uh, an enterprise um, centrally administered and hosted system. Um, essentially what we're doing is we're uh, creating efficiencies in the management of textbooks and, and library assets. Uh, we're ensuring that we have greater visibility into the status of those assets. We're, um, we're looking at implementing processes that allow us to more efficiently move books across schools, uh, thereby reducing the number of textbooks that we would be buying to replace books that are reported missing or lost. So the net effect of this upgrade is to actually reduce costs to the district um, incurred when we buy textbooks that we don't necessarily need to buy because they exist somewhere but we can't track them um, uh, in the old system. Uh, so we're, we're having a little bit of, uh, we're experiencing some pains in the transition because of the internet connection that we're having right now, but the expectation is that those will be flushed out as this system is in use at many school districts across the state and across the country. This is essentially the, the tier one solution that's in place um, uh, across the nation. Okay, so then my, the second my, part of my question was, how did you engage the school sites? Or was this just, sorry to be blunt, but like a top-down thing that went down to the school sites and said, you're going to be using this? So we have a, we have a project team that, uh, that includes representatives from various um, groups in the, in the organization. We have our library and textbook uh, management staff participating in this project. And that team interfaces directly with our school sites. Um, and, and, and communicates with schools as to the transition that's taking place. Uh, the project itself also um, focuses on communications in the rollout of the, of the new system. It's very possible that we, could, um, that we may have missed some stakeholders or, or, or certainly that we could be improving on the communications, um, but it's certainly a focus of the project as we want this to, be, to go as smoothly as possible. So just to make sure that I understand, this was something that happened here at the CERNA Center and then we reached down to school sites and said this is the new system that we have and started with our training, correct? It's for some, it's a new system. For some, it is basically an upgrade of the existing system. But we did not engage the librarians or the, the technicians at the school sites to find out what the best option for them to make it more efficient? Uh, we did not engage them in the process of selecting the system as this is not a new system. This is simply an upgrade to the existing system. I, th I think for future reference, just when we're doing stuff like that, I think it's important that we really reach down at the school sites and ask them their opinion of, to make sure that they can do an efficient job instead of just having it be coming from the top and moving it down and saying this is the way we're going to do things because it creates a lot of grumble and and then there's issues that arise right and then all of a sudden us board members are getting the phone calls mm -hmm. because of the issues if we just started from the beginning of engaging them i think it would make it a lot easier in, in the future Marosas. Hello. Going off uh, what uh, Board Member Pritchett was talking about, recently um, a friend of mine in my campus was doing a, a research paper, and she said that she was in, um, she was using the computers on campus, but everything related that she she knew for a fact didn't have anything bad on it, but was related to LGBTQ uh, related subjects was blocked. And going off what you uh, answered to. Um, board member Pritchett's uh, question, you said that there's ways to go about unblocking certain things. Is there like steps that students can take so so that they could like call you or go about unblocking certain things? Absolutely. Technology services receives um, contact from students all the time and we would encourage our students to contact us directly. The uh, turnaround is fairly immediate on unblocking these uh, resources and and again it's we the filter is uh, is not the the logic that is used by the filter is not ours and um, it's it's uh, flawed uh, in some cases right it can only be so certain about what is and is not safe for students so when we receive these requests we do unblock those resources um, as quickly as we can so okay. contact uh, technology services the email address for all those listening is support 
at seusd.edu. Okay, that's awesome Thank to you. hear. Thank you so much. And I'll make sure to spread that information because I know that there's been students with concerns about certain things like that. And also, I, I love the idea that we're kind of like starting to push more towards what we should be doing, which is making sure that technology is available for students. But I think that's really important. There are certain um, certain things that you brought up, like ebooks and how that's available, but I don't think that's really common knowledge um, with high school students. I don't think as it's as common as it as it should be. So, are there like any plans going into um, like the plans? planning stages to make sure that students are more aware of all the resources that you were talking about because I I because I didn't know about a lot of them and I think um, I think that's common for for a lot of students getting the word out is one of our biggest challenges and and um, we would love to hear any ideas about how to better and more efficiently reach our our students and our teachers we uh, we send uh, parent letters and notices home every opportunity that we get. We uh, post uh, bulletins to uh, our principal's bulletin board. Uh, we send out mass emails, but anything that we could do to more efficiently um, reach our students, uh, we would love to hear about. And if you ever need help, like um, getting together a focus group or anything like that, I, I'm in contact with lots of students, so I can help you with that. And then your project team, um, I there. I think it's important that students are involved in kind of like the concerns that go around like technology related uh, issues and things like that. So um, if you need help finding students to, to get involved in that, I'd love we'll to. We'll take you up on that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. But you, really, really, like m contact me whenever you can or anything like that because I'd love to make sure that students are kind of in, involved in that. And uh, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Member Ryan. Um, so all I wanted to say is, Board Member Rojas, beautiful. I, I so appreciate what you're saying. When we want to get students more engaged, when we get, want to get them using the product, the technology tools you've developed, one of the best ways to do that is to try it in the field with students and to ask for their feedback. So I really would like moving forward, both with existing initiatives and looking at you know, changing reiterations of our programs and tools that we're offering in our, our suite of technology services, doing some student focus groups, taking it into the field, because if we get not only the genuine feedback of students around how we strengthen these tools, but also if they're excited about the tools themselves having tried them, then they're going to be our best ambassadors in sharing the information. I think that's an outstanding mm -hmm. idea. I think you did so well. <laughs> <laughs> Member Rosas, your, your light's still on the air. All right. Very well. Uh, my member, bank. I, I just had a few questions. Um, you know, board member Rosa's like was spot on, on point with um, a, a follow up question that I was going to have. So I'm not going to repeat your your comments, but I do have a question regarding uh, digital textbooks. And I really, I, you may have this number, you may not, Elliot. But I kind of want to know. It seems like our school district is moving towards online digital textbook. Um, do you have a percentage or a number on like kind of an assessment of where our schools are at in terms of teachers in the classroom are still using textbooks to teachers that are engaging in the like the digital textbooks? We haven't um, adopted a digital version of, of textbooks um, per se, mm -hmm. but we do have a number of uh, supplemental materials and, and resources as affiliated to existing textbooks that are available to our teachers in the classroom today. And I think Ms. Uh, Dr. Taylor has uh, additional information on there. Yeah. <laughs> Why am I waking this up? Um, just to, to clarify, though, with our math adoption, which is our most recent adoption, we did purchase print and digital okay. resource as a part of that adoption. And with most adoptions nowadays, you, you do a hybrid approach. Um, so with math, we know that is available for um, that most recent adoption. Okay, and the second question is more about utilizing social media. I know that 
you know, um, the filters are important, but I wonder in terms of the next step for a technology plan, if there's been conversation about using social media platforms, because our students are on it. I know there's a lot of content filter that needs to happen, but I wonder if that's a discussion that's been talked about. This could be a comms thing, but I think it's also big on the technology piece, because I know our students are engaged in social media platforms, and so I, I kind of wanted to have a conversation about that, or Elliot, if you've looked into that, about how, in terms of 21st century kind of education, how are we utilizing social media platforms? We have some, uh, some items in the queue that are very social media-like and are certainly more uh, interactive and allow for more collaboration among students and teachers uh, within our, uh, our existing ecosystem. And we're just in the process of kind of iterating through functionality so that we can train our teachers and ensure that we have comfort and that, um, you know, that the foundation is laid before we, you know, just kind of blast the district with all of these resources and different types of tools. We certainly do, um, from a communication standpoint, employ social media to reach out to our uh, constituencies, uh, but I'd be happy to, to talk more about uh, um, any ideas you might have about how we could integrate uh, social media more in the uh, instructional Seven. Yeah, because I'm just thinking about our school site. I know we have a Facebook page, but I'm thinking even like, even if our schools had their own Facebook page, right, having some kind of social media policy platform to really get our parents and our students to be engaged at that level, I think that's really important. I don't know if that's something that we've looked at. Um, it seems like it's a comms and technology thing, but um, I think it's something we need to put on our radar. Or I'll just start creating a Facebook page for all my schools. I mean, right? I, I don't know if we have a policy around social media platforms, but I think that's really important in terms of engagement. Yeah, but one, yeah. Of, one of the things to keep in mind is that a lot of social media platforms have age restrictions associated mm -hmm. to them, and so we have to be mindful of that as Absolutely. well. But, but certainly there's, there's probably some space where we can leverage those resources. Yeah. There we go. Very good. Uh, well, no other comments. Uh, I just say, wow, great. I'm very impressed with seeing the work there. So thank you for your work and your work and helping make this happen. Uh, it's absolutely the kind of stuff we need to do to make our district uh, you know, keep prospering and be a place where students want to come and parents want to bring their students. So very impressive, and I look forward to seeing uh, more work. One of my friends calls it no, no student left offline. So that's yeah. the kind of, uh, I think that's where we're moving. So that's really wonderful. So thank you very much. <laughs> we invite you to stay. We've only got about another hour left. So you're welcome to, you to join us. Uh, well, let's move to our next item, LCAP. Elliot, welcome. You're, you're already up there. Our annual update. So as Elia gets ready in this LCAP update, the staff will lay out the goals and strategies in relation to the and state Kathy, priority. Come on down. And link them clearly and directly to the local decisions and the resources that uh, we are able to use. As we know, the new LCAP template is a bit different from the one that we've used for the past two years. Uh, it provides a format for our district to plan in conjunction with data provided through the school, California school dashboard. So looking forward to... Um, presentation and also an opportunity to really um, to thank our, our parents and community members who provide us with helpful feedback in developing the plan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bonda. Thank you and good evening again, uh, Board President Hansen, Board Members, Superintendent Bonda, uh, Elliot Lopez, and I'm here tonight with Kathy Morrison, our LCAP SIPSA coordinator, and Sarah Petrowski, our Student Outcomes Coordinator. In tonight's brief presentation, we will review the purpose of the LCAP annual update, dis discuss district activities aligned to the LCAP, and note the district's progress towards our goals. Lastly, we will present some reflection and ask for board member feedback. Included with the LCAP template is a section titled the annual update. According to California Ed Code, districts must produce an annual update every year as part of the development of the LCAP. We use this update to check progress and to direct our efforts for the following year's LCAP. Tonight we present to you the highlight 
of this year's update. And a more comprehensive update is still under development and will be provided with the LCAP draft. Turn this to uh, Kathy. <clears throat> Good evening, President Hansen, board members, and Superintendent Bonda, Kathy Morrison. We have created an LCAP infographic that detailed the highlights of the LCAP. For the mid-year review, we have updated the infographic to show progress. This slide details the district's progress toward expected outcomes. We've met our goals for student achievement on standardized tests, reclassification, and professional learning through the addition of collaborative time. Graduation rate and A through G completion rate are determined by the state and will be available in May. As part of our mid-year review, we collaborated with partners across the organization to identify LCAP-aligned actions and initiatives underway. Of the many that are included in the LCAP, we present here just a few. And tonight we want to highlight two from goal one. Our district moved to class size reduction in grades K-3, which is required by LCFF, but we are well ahead of the 2020 deadline put forth by the state. Class size reduction was one of the top priorities for the LCAP highlighted by the community last year. We also added academic counselors in our high schools, lowering the student counselor ratio. For unduplicated students, counselors play a pivotal role in decreasing barriers to post-secondary education, ensuring successful pathway completion, and supporting students to graduate high school. This slide highlights the district's progress toward expected outcomes around facilities, climate, and student engagement. We've met our goal for maintaining facilities, 100% of the schools inspected are considered exemplary or good. By hiring additional nurses and social workers, we have increased the availability of wraparound services for our students. Unfortunately, our attendance year to date has not met the stated goal, but since this is a mid-year report, we will continue to update this metric. The metric for school climate requires that districts survey students, teachers, and parents on measures of safety and connectedness. While we surveyed teachers and parents last spring, we, sorry, students and teachers last spring, we didn't survey parents at all, and we did not survey teachers on measures of safety. Our district survey will be administered later this spring in order to be included in the LCAP. Staff are very proud of the work being performed in support of Goal 2, some of which is represented here. For example, the Lifting Student Voices Project helped deepen student understanding and perception of culture, climate topics, and social and emotional learning by engaging kids in thoughtful discussion in a safe environment. The process was transformative for students as they had the opportunity to learn from their peers and can now appreciate a stronger connection to someone that they had perhaps not engaged with previously. It also spotlighted equity issues for further discussion by student, parent, and staff. Another example of great work in this area is our district's Connect Center, which provides much needed mental health supports for some of our neediest students and families. Finally, this slide details the district's progress toward expected outcomes in family and community engagement. The state allows districts to select local measures for parent involvement, and our district is continuing its positive progress. For goal three activities, one highlight is the exceptional support from our teachers and other school staff for the home visit program in 42 schools. This program is a key bridge between home and school. Because of their participation, we are well on the way to meeting our goal for the number of home visits completed in a year. The Family and Community Empowerment Department worked with the Academic Office Math Training Specialist to develop and present Common Core Math to parents in the Parent Leadership Pathway. These sorts of collaborations give parents the tools they need to be active partners in their child's education. 
Sarah Petrowski will now explain the California School Dashboard and how it will inform our LCAP development. Good evening, Board President Hansen, members of the board, and Superintendent Bonda. I'm Sarah Petrowski. As you know, the state launched its new accountability system last month called the California School Dashboard. So what does the system look like? The rating is determined using a combination of status, performance level, and change. The system represents a big shift. Previously, districts and schools only had to reach a level of proficiency, but this system is much more nuanced. Districts and schools that might have a lower performance level but experienced positive growth will receive credit for moving in the right direction. The California School Dashboard has four tabs that display data in different ways. This is a screenshot of the student group tab that shows how all of our student groups are performing on the state indicators from the California School Dashboard. Because of the lagging nature of the data presented here, this is just one component of our data review as we work on the LCAP. The new LCAP template asks us to reflect and report on three areas when looking at our data, progress, needs, and gaps, which provides us with a useful framework to think about our data. After reviewing our data on the California School Dashboard, stakeholders have observed that we are making progress on our ELA and math CAS scores for nine of 11 student groups for which the California School Dashboard currently provides data. We do still have areas that are in need of attention, such as high suspension rates, progress for our English learners, and declining graduation rates. Our data also shows gaps, in particular for students with disabilities and in our chronic absenteeism rates. In addition to the California School Dashboard, our departments are also monitoring data in real time where possible as part of their ongoing work through the Data Integrity Project, the SCUSD Data Dashboard, and other reports. Through monitoring such as this, we have seen promising trends in discipline rates between the 15, 16, and 16, 17 school years. This current data provides insight into how things are working as the work is being done. Because of the limited time between the California School Dashboard rollout and this year's LCAP development, we knew that it is critical to bring our stakeholders up to speed as quickly as possible on the dashboard. This is the outreach that we have done to, with our community to educate them on the California School Dashboard so they can continue to build an understanding about SCUSD's progress and participate in the LCAP process in a meaningful way. Tonight, we have our LCAP, member, LCAP PAC members here to share their experiences with you. Welcome back. <laughs> Good evening, uh, President Hansen, board member Banda, and other board members. I mean, Superintendent Banda, I'm sorry. Um, my name is Frank DeYoung. I'm with Hollywood Park. And uh, I have been to several of these meetings. Um, I'm not going to say they were well attended, which is, as far as parent outreach goes, that's always a concern for me. It's like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And I've heard all the reasons why people aren't coming, but bottom line is no matter how you change it, people don't come. Um, they were very informative, uh, especially the, the one that I was allowed to go to that was before the uh, dashboard was um, sent out and made public. And uh, my biggest concern with the dashboard is there's a lot to learn. There's a lot of information, and you have to understand the nuances of it and that it's a point in time and things like that, and that's the kind of things that concern me. But I think from where I sit, the district did a pretty good job of trying to reach out and, and make opportunities for people to find out about it. Thank you for your time.
Good evening, um, board members, Superintendent Bonda. Uh, my name is Cha Vang, and I am Executive Director for Hmong Innovating Politics. Um, I did attend the, the training with the uh, staff on the California dashboard. So I did, I've been through multiple trainings. Um, but tonight I'm here to really address, to talk about what I've been doing with EL, uh, LCAP. Pack. Um, since uh, the implementation of LCFF about three, four years ago, uh, HIP has been a part of, um, every year we've been a part of LCAP and EL. Um, and to assure that our EL students and parents are not forgotten in the process. Um, we recognize that SAC Unified has an increase in English learner uh, reclassification rates, but we also uh, recognize that EL students still make a large population of your student um, here in SAC Unified. And, and under LCFF with Prop 55, they will continue to, to bring in more funding. Um, I am um, a former, I was a graduate of SAC Unified and a former EL student. And so that's where my passion comes from. Um, you know, it took me a long process, a long, and with a lot of guidance and support from educators to get to be reclassified in my sophomore year at, at John F. Kennedy and graduated as a, with honors. Um, and so something that I continue to push for EL support, um, it is my hope that all um, EL students also get the opportunity to follow the same path. Um, and so in addition to just being, to being on LCAP every year, HIP has um, hosted with community organizations, community forums to educate parents, students, and other community, interested community members about, uh, and then also in those community forums, we've encouraged parents to, and community stakeholders to express what their needs are and what they're experiencing at school, uh, school site levels. Um, and to take it one step further this year, we've, uh, we've also understand that these events are also intimidating. And so what HIP has done is we have attended school site council meetings. Just seeing what is happening on the ground level is so important. And what, we've, what we see is that there is a disconnect between the district and the school sites. Our parents are still struggling trying to figure out what the connection between LCAP and what their students need in the schools, right? Um, and so right now we're currently working with uh, some Susan B. Anthony parents to host a meeting at their school to ask questions that they really need um, answers so that they understand what's happening. Um, as much as HIP loves organizing the community, we also have limited capacity and we are not able to attend every school and do it with every parent and every school site council. And so we're looking to the board members to create and build a support system that provides school site councils with a way for them to structuralize um, a process so that they can take full advantage of the um, supplemental funding that's coming for EL students. Right? Um, and we hope to, for this board to also utilize the LCAP members more efficiently at the school site level. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cha and Frank, thank you. Um, using the information presented in this update and input from our stakeholders, leadership will begin drafting the next LCAP. One of our one of our drivers will be aligning the LCAP to the board adopted strategic plan to increase coherence. And then on May 4th, we will bring the draft forward to begin the public review and comment process. As part of this process, we will, we will solicit community feedback on the draft. Per ed code, stakeholders include a broad range of constituents, including principals, teachers, staff, bargaining units, parents, and pupils. The specific outreach approaches will be tailored to the groups we want to engage. Because this is a three-year plan, we want to ensure that the LCAP supports continuous improvement 
over a sustained period. So a goal of the annual review process is to receive input and feedback on our progress towards our LCAP goals. And at this time, we invite you to uh, provide us with your reflection and insights. Our colleagues are here to help us answer any questions that you might have as well. Public comment. We have four public comments. Darlene Anderson, followed by Lashanya Brazell, Angie Sutherland, and Carl Pinkston. Welcome. Making Thank up you. for lost okay. time. Yes, Darlene Anderson. Okay, let's see. The LCAP was basically created because California had a large failure rate in minority communities with children and homeless and special ed, and it gave the district a way to utilize funding that was Title I, and now it's all moving towards the LCAP process, the local control, local accountability. That means local people have a right to have a voice in this. How this district has limited input from the community and doesn't really generate, because I understand it's overwhelming to have so many people wanting a piece of the pie. But when you don't focus on the students who are really not making it, it makes it a little bit easier. Because the people who want to make it, the people who are going to ensure that their children are making it, are out and are participating. Now, when we look at a school site council and a school that is failing students, we don't have poverty parents who are advocating for those children. Most of those parents don't even know how to do it. So the training for development for community members needs to come from the district. We don't have a Title I person that uh, leads uh, training for parents anymore. Actually, there are limited and no trainings, hardly, when it comes to planning at the, dis at the, at the, you know, at the level of school sites. I don't know what to say, because I talked to Daryl Roberts, and he said, 18% of African-American students are at or above the 50th percentile. My student was one of those students who were in the 18%. I'm worried, and when this district has over 11,000 or about that African-American students, and I say only 18% are at where they should be, what are we really talking about? Most of those parents who I try to provide a little bit of support for think that they can fight this battle on their own. This is huge. This is a nationwide issue because we went through slavery and we went through being owned as a people. Well, we are not owned anymore. Many people come to America, cross the shores, and come to America and become American citizens. Our people are not being publicly engaged because they don't do public policy. They don't do advocacy, and when they do, a lot of them get burned. A lot of them go to jail. A lot of them have their children removed. We are not training the people who need to take care of children in this, and that's our people. Who, we have a district with 70% poverty. How are we going to impact change without acknowledging that all children have a right to education? This LCAP did not address the suspension and expulsion rate, which has grown significantly, and, and the dropout rate, which has grown significantly in the last four years. We need a process that's really real, that engages the public, and that we need to have the talk. We've had to talk several times. We've had this room packed with community members who were concerned, and we disenfranchised them because we didn't listen. Sacramento City Unified School District needs to listen to the community. This is a painful thing, but we need to deal with failure. Thank <coughs> you. And good night. Good evening. Lashanya Brazil. Okay. <laughs> I'm tired. Listen, they didn't say when you get in your 40s. You say your 40s are supposed to be vibrant and, you know, show prime. They didn't say, at, they didn't say after 830 your body starts shutting down. They didn't tell me that. So <laughs> good evening, board members. How are all how you are doing this evening? I'm LaShawnya Brazil, and today I would like to speak to you on behalf of the Black Parallel School Board, our priorities for the local control funding, LCAP, accountability fund, Plan. On January 1st, 2014, the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress, 
KSAP system was established. The Smarter Balance Assessment System utilizes a computer adaptive and performance tests that show what students know and what they are able to do. However, based on the 2015-16 assessment, only 23% of African American students met or exceeded in English language art compared to 61% white students. Therefore, Black Parallel School Board recommends that the district, the district uh, include in the LCAP the purchases of 602 Chromebooks for the low performing schools. And then lastly, I will conclude by stressing that we need to move our district into a 21st century multicultural education system, a high quality cultural responsive and a whole child learning community. In other words, our district will provide all students a first class learning environment that respect and honor all students of color and the communities they belong. Again, thank you for your time, LaShania Brazil with the Black Bear. Thank School. you very much. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> and good night. <laughs> Hello, I'm Angie Sutherland, speaking as a parent. Uh, I have a child at Hollywood Park Elementary, and I wanted to comment on the um, data at a glance, which is nice, but um, I was hoping we would receive a little bit more drilled down detailed data, um, so hope, hoping to get a report on that. Um, look In looking at this um, and mark, where it's marked that goals were met, I would like to know how we know that. So for instance, um, on goal, goal number two, um, it says met goal for clean, welcoming, well-maintained schools. So how do we know if schools are welcoming? How was that goal quantified or qualified? Um, and then I don't see the suspension data here. The discipline data should definitely be on this. Um, what I do like about the LCAP is that it forces us as a district to look at progress and goals and provide a listing of expenditures. Um, I would like to see that as well for the special education annual plans, as well as the engagement process that goes along with the LCAP to have that same process on the special education annual plans since they seem to be developed later in the, in the year, like at the very tail end of the year, and then not really a lot of time to review that and assess that. Um, so I think that if we could use this a similar engagement process to that as we do for the LCAP, that would be a nice change. Um, and then lastly, um, just looking at the timelines and next steps, um, like for in, I, I see that the public hearing on the LCAP is going to be, well, the draft will be May 4th. And then the public hearing will be June 1st, and then the adoption June 15th. I don't know when the SELPA plan will be. Um, it's probably going to be somewhere in this same time. So it would be nice for, if the board could um, anticipate that and maybe try to get some information before that those annual plans are brought to you for approval. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you very much. Welcome. Good evening, um, Board President Hansen, Superintendent Banda, and board members. Uh, my name is Carl Pinkston. Tonight I'm representing Community Priority Coalition, but probably two weeks from now I'll be representing another organization. <laughs> <laughs> so let's not. So tonight I'm Community Priority Coalition. So uh, just to let you know, one is that um, I really didn't have much to articulate uh, tonight or materials to provide for you tonight, but to let you know at the next board meeting that we will be presenting one, an alternative budget to our recommendations of what that alternative budget should include as part of the LCAP process. And then also three, um, how we see the LCAP process going forward. 
the Community Priority Coalition two months ago held a a uh, community forum where we had uh, community members come in and talk about what the LCAP process is, what they're getting their input. So we'll be bringing all of that information forward. But I think our priorities, are, I, I think more or less will be pretty much the same. Uh, we would like to have class size reduction from K to 12. We would like, once again, to see culturally competent professional development at the school site level and then after school and early intervention programs as well, and of all those three elements, uh, we would like to have seen. Um, I know we have put forward a number of these proposals before in our third year, um, but we, uh, once again, we'll uh, bring them forward again and hope that they are incorporated as part of the LCAP as well as integrated as part of the uh, budgeting process. Thank you. Thank you. Tony Tinker. Welcome. Good evening, board and um, Superintendent Bonda. I'm speaking on behalf of as a parent tonight. I, like Carl, wear many different hats, so in a couple weeks I'll come back with ethnic studies and talk about ethnic studies. <laughs> um, but tonight I want to talk about the LCAP and going through the different trainings and looking at it through the eyes of a parent and realizing that there is a lot of educational language in the LCAP and the new um, statewide system that we're going to be using that we don't talk the same language. And it's gonna be very imperative that as a parent coming in and talking to parents and being on the ground and being able to communicate this, that we begin to educate parents on the language and the acronyms and all of these different things so that they will engage, so that they feel part of that conversation and can engage with the teachers, with the administrators and so forth on a level that they feel welcome. The second thing is that on an ethnic studies level, looking at LCAP and on the LCAP committee, I see that there's no line item for ethnic studies. And in the resolution, that was promised to be in there. And I have concerns that even though as the district is very supportive of this item, going forward and in 2020, that this may not be included and that it can continue to be funded and moved along. Because this was something that the students saw me, who was a representative on the board, along with the community, felt very impelled to be able to do in the community. It also uh, addresses a lot of the eight state priorities that we're looking at to be able to serve students who are underrepresented, um, un unduplicated, and so forth. And that speaks to a lot of bringing forth and raising these issues in the LCAP that we want to see. A lot of self-awareness, a lot of um, student success, students' um, absences going down and so forth is, can be seen through using ethnic studies and that's a lot of research has shown that. And so I feel like that needs to be something that we seriously look at and consider and this board considers to be a part of this process. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Wonderful comments. Uh, two quick announcements before we do the board um, uh, comments. One, I want to announce that we're going to add uh, under our regular item of district parent advisory committees, we're going to add the LCAP committee to be one of our regular uh, presentations. So that will be something going forward and you know that'll be part of our agenda, uh, I assume, in perpetuity until the governor and legislature create a new LCAP in 20 years. Um, and secondly, I will entertain a motion to extend the meeting to 11 p.m. So move for election. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. Opposed? Angry? Uh, uh, abstain? Aye. Okay, done. Um, Board Member Ryan. Tony, I want to thank you for your comments. They were so astute and... Um, Germain for the conversation, in particular given that I was just reached out to by a teacher that 
is on the list of teaching physicians to be eliminated in ethnic studies. And the irony of this is this was at one of our pilot schools. So we made this commitment as a board universally, not just to adopt the philosophy of ethnic studies being a top priority for all high schools, but a plan for piloting to scale with the vision being ethnic studies offered at all of our high schools. And so it was very surprising to me and a bit discouraging to hear that we were actually backsliding versus moving towards that vision. So thank you for coming and reminding us that that does have a line item in LCAP moving forward. It should and it will. Um, we'll work with staff to make sure that happens and really hold us to the commitment that we made when we passed our ethnic studies resolution. Um, I also just want to say, in terms of the feedback from the LCAP PAC members, you gave us excellent words and words that for me actually gave me some real pause for concern. And I'll be candid with you. Um, this is now, you know, two years being on the board, my third year of LCAP, right? And I have had wonderful committed community members that I have appointed to the LCAP that have selected not to continue on in the process because they have not felt valued. They have not felt like their voices led to the sorts of investments that really merited the participation, the time and energy they put in. So that's no, um, I think, reflection on the hard work of Kathy Morrison, who I know works tirelessly, and Sarah Petrosky, I know also works tirelessly to try and make the process inclusive, and this is new in many ways. And yet, there is a problem when we're not seeing increased participation year to year, rather a decrease in participation, when we're only seeing the usual stakeholders coming out because these are our long-term committed activist parents and others feel disenfranchised and don't come back. And so when I'm hearing things like, you know, we have parent advisory committee meetings where four people are showing up of, you know, 20, that is incredibly troubling to me. And it leads me to the question, why? Why do we have lower engagement? Why are our parent advisory committee members not feeling connected to the LCAP work in a way that actually leads to outcomes? And if, in fact, this is meant to be the participatory budgeting tool that LCAP was lifted up to be, empowering our community to fund the things that we prioritize. LCAP PAC advises the board, but then we have this opportunity through that, hopefully, interaction and relationship to fund what we know will have impact taking our parent and community input strongly into account. So I have a lot of questions around that. So, you know, the first thing I want to ask, and this is, you know, a question really because I'm, I'm curious and I'm, I'm, sur I'm surprised, right? So when I look at models of parent engagement, um, you know, traditionally what I've found is that we employ people who have backgrounds in parent engagement. And so I was frankly kind of surprised, you Elliot, when you took over this body of work. And so one, I would like to ask just genuinely, I want to understand why are you leading the LCAP PAC work with Kathy and Sarah, given they actually have a grounding in this work and you have focused your career on technology? I would defer that question to uh, the superintendent and uh, uh, you know, and maybe uh, you can take that question. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, in the absence of, we had Al Rogers, Dr. Rogers was uh, overseeing that. And so in the absence of when he left to go over to the county office of ed, um, I needed someone to, to fill in and get and continue to support Kathy and team to be able to do that. So Elliot uh, graciously accepted that responsibility and continued to work with these two and others who are doing the behind the scenes work around um, the LCAP and so and also part of that was to maintain consistency without changing cons you know drastically Elliot was already doing some work with uh, with Al Rogers and some of the team so it was familiar face somebody who already had uh, working relationships with these folks 
So I, I appreciate the rationale that we lost a leader at a key point in the process. And I also appreciate your hard work, Elliot. I'm not dismissing this. But what I will say is, for me as a board member, as a parent of a child in the district, soon to be two children in the district, it says a lot to me about the priority that we place on LCAP when we don't put a content expert, a practitioner, someone who is grounded in parent engagement work in a leadership role to carry out this work. Because what I've been saying for the last two years is we're growing this, you know, this work year to year and we're going to improve it. We're going to improve the model. We're going to increase parent engagement. And this actually demonstrates a lower priority and a slide back as far as I'm concerned. It's very troubling to me. So then the one other thing I would like to point out is, you know, irrespective of the work to develop the LCAP plan, we have a leadership problem. We have a problem in not growing our pipeline of parent leaders that are showing up to our board meetings that are empowered and understand the budget process at the school site level so that they can impact change. And frankly, you know, part of what we're doing with LCAP and our budget should be funding the Parent Leadership Academy. And I find it very troubling that this this is no longer a mechanism for growing our next generation of hopefully school board members and leadership in all levels of Sac City Unified. And I don't think that we can pat ourselves on the back as a model of LCAP and PAC until we actually rectify all of these wrongs. Um, member Bang. Oh man, it's okay. Let's, we can do this. Um, first, I um, I just want to thank Kathy and Sarah for all your hard work. Um, I know the hours that you poured in to really help facilitate the LCAP process. Um, I have a few comments and a few questions. Um, the first thing is um, I know there are some really great recommendations that come out of the LCAP committee. And um, given that much of the decision on supplemental and concentration funding is really um, the decision-making process for supplemental and concentration funding happens at a school site level, um, how are we actually sharing the LCAP committee's recommendation with the school site council when they're working on their SIPSA and, the, and they're you know, figuring out the allocation at their school site? That's the, that's the first that's the first thing because I think Cha brought up a really good point from Hip the work that we've been doing with uh, with the work that they've been doing with Susan B Anthony and I I would actually I think it's a, it might be an effective model I don't know but the first thing is I just know there's great recommendations that come out of out of our out of our LCAP and I could totally see school site council looking at the LCAP given the flexibility because every school site is different but really see goals and recommendations maybe aligning some of that. Um, with the decision that's happening at the school site. So I yes. give this, okay. So um, every school's site plan requires the school site council to select alignment with the LCAP. And the process, at the point that the LCAP comes out, the school single plans are already completed. So what we instituted this year, in the absence of having a district advisory council and an elected body of site council members, Lisa Hayes in the Title I office and I have put together three meetings we call the School Site Council Learning Collaborative. First time we've tried it. And our goal was to provide an opportunity for parents who, anyone who is a school site council member um, to come to, we thought we'd start with three meetings this year. As you know, one fizzled because of the dashboard delay. But um, we haven't had great success reaching a lot of parents with those. Um, even asking, you know, again, through our typical school channels, we would like every school to send one representative. Um, we hadn't received the participation that we hoped. But it is our goal that the single plans, the SIPSAs at the school sites align with the goals of the LCAP. Okay. Um, is it possible, and I don't, 
because I'm thinking about the role of LCAP members, and I know Frank and Laura has done a really great job. I can only speak for my area, because I know they've been very active in coming to the LCAP meetings, and also, you know, getting feedback from various schools, is to really rethink how maybe even our LCAP members collaborate with school site council. Maybe that could be a possible way of building capacity and engagement and participation. Um, I, I know that our, our, you know, LCAP members are also probably, they have some kind of they also have capacity, limit capacity as well, but I think that would also be a good option to explore and I, by looking at the roles and tasks of LCAP members, because I think we talked about, you know, them being involved in the process, figuring out ways to empower them to really own what it means to be an LCAP rep um, as part of the, the space. And so I, I would, you know, I encourage you to take a look at that and figure out ways looking at the roles of LCAP members. Mm -hmm. Sarah, I actually have a follow-up question regarding the dashboard. Um, is the dashboard, um, and I think you guys have met, said this in your, sorry, I'm like trying to stay focused because it's late, so, and I need some coffee, but um, is this a tool that's going to be used for LCAP, the dashboard? Yes, yeah, the California School Dashboard, the intention is that it is going to provide us with the feedback on how schools are doing across the state. So as LCAPs are being developed, everyone has access to the same information. This year, the data presented on the dashboard is a field test, and so a lot of that data is old, but what we are told is that when it is refreshed next fall, the data is all going to represent the things that happened in this current school year. And so it will be up-to-date information that paints the picture for our community. Okay. Um, so I'm going to come back to the dashboard really quick, but I did have a question about the infographic that you guys had. And I noticed that the infographic in particular, uh, when we look at the measurable outcomes, they're really district-wide. And I'm wondering if there's a way, whether, whether to redo the infographic or really help the public understand how... Um, how we're doing in terms of services for our EL and low income students, because I noticed that the infographic is very district wide. And so like, I don't know the graduate graduation rates among EL, right? Or I don't know the graduate graduation rates among um, uh, our foster youth, right? And I think that's also very important because I wanna make sure that, you know, while we, it's great to have that district wide, I really wanna see the, the outcomes for the specific targeted groups that, that, that the majority of the funding was coming for. And so, if you can speak on that. We, we do have all of that data. Okay. Um, we have it in a less pretty Excel table format that okay. we can show um, the infographic as the more user-friendly that, version. That information is shared with the LCAP committee, is that correct? Is that information shared with the LCAP committee? Yeah, we, we have shared the the Excel file that has all the disaggregated information for our metrics, okay. and then um, the district's data dashboard has all of that disaggregation as well. Okay. Um, so I'm, you know, wow, just I, as I'm looking at our data dashboard, uh, the state data dashboard, and, you know, I'm just looking at the colors, and I'm seeing red with our students of disability, and it's just so disheartening, and even suspension rate around African Americans. So... You know, I, I, I think for, for me, it's like I, I see the, the outcomes or the data and I get, I'm wondering, like, what are we doing to address these outcomes, right? Like, I don't know how we're, how we're measuring. I mean, we, we're measuring the progress, but I don't know what we're doing specifically to address the suspension rate. And so is that something that LCAP has talked about in terms of, you know, what the next steps are and the recommendations? I'll let Kathy answer that. I was going to say, um, you know, we love the dashboard because it's so colorful and it's a very high level indicator, but it doesn't tell those really deep details that you're looking for. Um, Sarah actually quoted tonight that we have been looking at recent discipline data. Um, that is, the dashboard right now is the 2014 15 school year. So we believe as a district, we've actually made progress that's not reflected in the dashboard, and that's just what we have to live with. Um, I don't have an answer for how we address it, but we were hoping that maybe some partner colleague would like to address that. Uh, I think we will be required to look at the data. 
that's we will be um, be forced to look at the data and to do something about that. We need to show progress, and if we don't show the progress, the county could be um, help us do that. So that's uh, the, um, the state is in there more funds for the county, so they could to look uh, to the data. So that's the LCAP. This will be like the the four year. There's some data where the state is looking at uh, very detail. So we will have to see those red. We have to show some progress in those actions. How are we going to do that? That's something that we need to decide as a district, as a, as a team. Okay. And then I just, I just had one last comment. Um, I know that the state dashboard, wow, I'm speaking much slower now, Daryl, because it's getting late. Does that work? I'm speaking slower. He's not even listening. I know. Um, I noticed that, you know, I think as a state dashboard, when they, when they share the data, um, the, Asian, the Asian American community is, is aggregated, right? And I think there's a lot of problems within that, right? Because if our API students are, our specific API students are um, not included in the data, they're also invisible in our strategies, right? And I know that a lot of the data we collect locally and then we send it to the state. Um, I'm wondering if there's a way for our school district to be able to really disaggregate the API data to really show what's happening as well. Uh, because I don't think looking at the student, the California dashboard um, can really tell the story of that, the story of what could be happening among Asian American students. And so, um, I don't know if this is something that we can talk about later on another, you know, another board meeting. Um, but I think that's something that distri the district needs to po possibly look into. It is, yeah. it is possible um, using the state ethnicity, um, controlling how the state dashboard displays the data is unfortunately out of our hands. But we, as a school district, we, we could probably take lead to be able to just disaggregate that data, right? Yes, and be it, able to reveal that to the public and show that to the public it does become a little bit tricky with showing it publicly because some of the end sizes become very very small when you're disaggregating the subgroups into um, a population say that only has 300 kids district wide and so we have to be sensitive to those things but as long as we're making sure that our student privacy issues are mm -hmm. attended to we do have that capability Okay, so that's probably something that I think I would probably bring to the policy committee um, and then maybe have a conversation as well with the data with you as well as Sarah on figuring out how we can do that. Thank you. Button still on. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Member Minnick. Thanks. Um, this, just real quick, and, and this came up for me as I was hearing Ms. Uh, Tinker's comments about the kind of the education language and the acronyms and, and it not being um, uh, always accessible to everyone. Um, I'm just wondering, so I had some concerns about, you know, the, the calendar we use for LCAP and how it aligns with the budget and whether it's, it's early enough to really have an impact on the budget. Um, I know that yeah, Member Rosas and I are, are you know, are meeting with you all about how to increase student engagement in this, and um, and then you know, Member Vang talked about the connection with the site councils. Um, I'm just wondering, is there a mechanism in place for us um, to start really looking at the structural and logistic elements of this um, now for next year? And and not that I want to create another committee, but Maybe I do, um, and maybe that would include maybe you know one or two of us. I'd be happy to, um, and you know some members from the current LCAP committee that have some insight on what's working, what's not, so we can really start thinking about. So we don't just repeat things exactly the same, and, and we figure out what's working and and what might be um, more efficient or give us better. Um, engagement from folks, um, you know, and, and, and kind of meet kind of, and I'm sure like, you know, I had my list of four things that just like popped up and I'm sure there's many others that we, you know, think of like how we could improve this process. Um, I just want to like, even though like right now we're talking about kind of the, this LCAPS recommendations, you know, coming, coming soon, but now would be the time for us to figure that out so we can hit the ground running and, 
in uh, the fall. So is there a system in place or do we need to create one? Uh, I'd like to get some insight. I would say that um, there are general timelines provided to us by the county, by the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence, et cetera, and we're really pretty much following those timelines. I think that we have an opportunity next year um, because we will be writing this year a three-year plan that will not change from year to year. So this is a shift for LCAP. Previously, the plans were rewritten every year. So next year, as I see it, could be a year to really dive in on monitoring and implementation. Um, I also want to encourage you know, everyone who I think has attended our workshops on LCAP they definitely are brought to a parent or student level. Um, I don't know if board member Rosas would want to share, but we did work with the students last year. Um, actually, it was mostly Sean and Will, and they took a long time really bringing the topics um, to a place that was accessible for students. So um, I think we have an opportunity to think about the calendar for next year and definitely bring in a diverse group to help us craft that calendar. Okay. And it doesn't necessarily have to be any or all of, of those things. I'm just thinking big picture, structurally, like is this, is this working as I'm hearing lack of engagement by you know, committee members and all stuff, like let's figure out how to fix that. And so if we start having those conversations, and I guess my question then for staff is what would that next step be to, to to start that conversation? Does that need to be led by you know, one of us? Does that need to be something that, that your department would, would take on? I, I don't know, I don't wanna create more work for folks, so, but I'm, I'm willing to take this on if, if we feel it has value. We can put it off till summer. I thought, I thought it was rhetorical. Oh, rhetorical. So we'll have a discussion about that. That won't be a staff decision, that'll be a board decision. Okay. Member Pritchett. I just have a really quick question. So I've um, heard some feedback from committee members that there's a lot of confusion in the meetings when the, about when they'll be placed on the agenda. So I just want to make sure that we're clear that there, there will be a standing item on the agenda and there will be no more confusion when talking made, to committee I made members. That announcement. I know, but I want to make sure that we're clear. That way when they go back to the committee, that they know that there won't be any more confusion because this is happening. I've, it seems like for the last three meetings, there's been some confusion when talking to the members. So, are we clear? Okay, thank you. Member Wu. Thank you, President Hansen. Um, taken aback by um, Ms. Tinker's comments regarding um, ethnic studies, and I, I, I recognize that the main purpose of today's presentation is about measuring progress. But recognizing, too, that the LCAP is a budget and planning tool, where would we find, then, in the LCAP um, uh, an enunciation of our board policy vis-a-vis -vis ethnic studies and found as a, as a, as a place uh, a line item identified in the LCAP? I think that currently it, we have the very first item in the LCAP, I think it's 1.1, covers um, what it takes to operate the district. So it includes teachers, materials, utilities, things like that. So ethnic studies, as far as I am aware, would be carried in there as with any um, curriculum. But I'm looking at Dr. Taylor for... That would... That would be correct. So it would fall under a couple, in a couple of areas around professional learning um, that's been provided that the teachers have engaged in around ethnic studies, curricular resources that have been purchased for ethnic studies. So those are the primary areas. And then I guess in general staffing, because those teachers are supported out of so, general So schools. ultimately if we were to, when we were, um, per, when we are presented the budget, if we were could ask to dive deeper into particular line items, you would be able to aggregate, uh, segregate that information out? 
With the assistance of my friend Gerardo, yes. <laughs> well, Mr. Um, Moneybags? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, we can do that. We actually, um, you know, the LCAP and the budget go hand in hand, so we could develop the two process. In the first reading, we present the LCAP, and, you know, there's a lot of um, data that we could put in there, but we, we could um, make a, a line. We could do that. And so... Um, so as not to overwhelm uh, Iris and, and Gerardo, I, I think that um, we can make put out a notice today that if there are particular line items uh, uh, that uh, members of the public, members of the LCAP committee like Ms. Dinker, would like to see regarding uh, um, ethnic studies, just as an example, but there might be other items as well, to let us know so that we can ask staff to then uh, uh, segregate that information on, on your all behalf and our behalf as well. Because we don't know what you're particularly interested in, but we are certainly as interested as you are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I make my comments, uh, I'll entertain a motion to uh, move the meeting adjournment time to 11.30 p.m. All in favor? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Thank you very much. Uh, to me, I see that this uh, leads me to believe that we need to do some revamping of our budget process for how we make budgetary decisions as a board and as a district. It's, I think, you know, a lot of it still, even with this new process, is quite opaque to us as board members and to the public. Uh, and I think that if we're going to be more of a hands-on board making decisions about how we prioritize the funds uh, and where we want them to go and are responsive to you know what we're hearing from the community and what the community is asking us that we agree with, you know, we don't really have mechanisms in place to be really responsive and really you know, put our hands into the budget. So um, let me just tell my fellow board members that we're going to be discussing that kind of offline in the next um, couple weeks. And then maybe we, as the executive committee meets to plan the next two board meetings, we look to make those more focused on the budget and kind of open up the budget process and talk about the things that are priorities. When I hear about, you know, that the community wants more, you know, if we, talk about funding for ethnic studies, which we made a commitment to, and we talk about expanding the number of uh, custodial staff, which I hear about a lot, when we talk about the poor maintenance at our athletic facilities, and we want to prioritize that and make that come out of our budget process. When I hear that we're paying for the, you know, the, we had a lease leaseback agreement to pay for this building, uh, that, and it's coming out of our developer fee funds when those monies should be directed towards the maintenance and facilities budget. When we need to start doing some of those things, and there are going to be some, there might be some tectonic shifts in this next budget coming up that are going to take a little getting used to. But I think if we make that shift, then we can be more involved in the budget process and make the LCAP more real make the participation by the community more real so there's more of an investment and people are going to want to be on that committee. And maybe we even figure out a way to expand it more so we can um, make it even more inclusive. And I think that'll make it more real. We'll get better feedback ourselves as board members because, you know, it takes a village to be a good school board member too. We None of us can do it by ourselves. We have to rely on having um, not only good staff work, but also having the community's eyes and ears and all the things that you're hearing about, you know, when you're at the school and then working with the people you're in connection with. So um, that's my big takeaway with this. I appreciate everyone's time and comments. And thank you very much for that. It was going to be a 10-minute presentation and 10-minute discussion. Not. <laughs> uh, now we will move on to Mr. Castillo on debt issuance and management, approved good, board policy. Yeah, good evening. Um, tonight we are recommending your approval board policy 3470. 
The first reading was at the March 16 board meeting. The proposed policy conforms to the new statutory requirements yeah, and reflects generally accepted practices and existing requirements that apply to that issuance. Board policy is required, these board policies require prior to issue new debt and we recommend your approval. Great, any uh, questions, comments from the board? Do I have a motion to approve? So moved, second. I hear a motion and a second, all in favor? Aye, oppose, abstain. Thank you very much. Good evening again. Um, we recommend that you approval of resolution 2931 to sell general obligation bonds for measure Q and R for an amount not to exceed $122 million. The first reading was at the March 16 board meeting. Mr. Jeff Small, financial advisor, and Ms. Amari Watkins, budget director, will be available to answer any questions at the end. But Jeff Small, we present the changes from the last presentation to this. Thank you, President Hansen, board, Superintendent Banda. Great news tonight. Um, there have been some very positive changes that are very beneficial to the district, uh, both in terms of, of projects and, and taxpayer savings. I think the most important thing is for several years now, the district has worked very hard to improve their credit rating from an A1. Um, the district was upgraded to a double A3 credit rating, which is very impressive. Uh, we received a very great report from Moody's Investor Service. They basically give an independent appraisal on how the district is doing. And their specific comment was it was the proactive management that has caused the financial improvement at the, at the district. Um, and that was the key reason for that credit rating upgrade. That actually translates into a $400,000 savings, which goes directly into district projects. So um, district has done a very, very good job in terms of its financial management. Uh, we've also, at the last presentation, we were going to look into the expenditures, the expenditure plans, and, and we did come up with a couple of changes. The district, uh, we're still recommending an issuance of $122 million. Of that, $112 million will be for Measure Q, uh, modernization projects um, and energy projects, class size reduction type of projects. Projects that the district would have done between 2017 and 2019, and also some additional projects that were going to commence in 2019. The Measure R issuance has been scaled down from $40 million to $10 million. The reason for that is to uh, take time to do the design work for that central kitchen project, which will take approximately two years. And I know that there was a, a presentation at the last meeting of, of what that timeline was. Um, finally, uh, at the last meeting, we talked about moving the, the bond maturity from 25 years to, to up to 30 years. And the purpose of that was to try to maximize as, as much bond proceeds as we possibly can and we feel that given the robust growth in the tax base that taking this step will help doing that. And finally I'd like to say that in the resolution that's before you uh, there is a procedure for um, a, an, a process to obtain an underwriter through an R, a request for proposal type of process. We believe through that process that we will be able to ensure that we're getting the lowest possible costs on the borrowings and, and be able to transfer those benefits directly to the district's taxpayers. We plan on bringing that selection back to the board on May 4th and um, being able to sell the bonds, which means lock in the interest rates by May 16th. With that, before you is a resolution to approve this action this evening. Um, it, op it authorizes the terms that I've discussed along with the form of various documents which um, are included in your packet, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have for us. Very good. Do we have any public comment? Mr. Barrios, any public comment? No public comment. Thank you. Do we have any questions, comments by the board? All right. Seeing none with just one brief comment on me, I uh, note on the 
the improved credit rating is really great, great news. And I think it, you know, applaud, uh, you know, uh, Gerardo and superintendent and staff for being uh, wise custodians of our taxpayer dollars. You know, we're sa making real savings for the taxpayers. Um, and that's the way that you get bonds passed in the future. So I appreciate all the good work on that. Thank you for sharing the news. And I know there's a lot of folks that were involved in that too and making applications to the, you know, the rating agencies and um, that's really good work. So that's, that's good news. And if sure. I can make one comment, I, I know it's late and I, I forgot to mention a very, very important point. Um, not only did you get an upgrade from Moody's from an A1 to a AA3, but uh, today Fitch Rating Agency announced a AAA rating on your GEO bonds. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't believe that, that I didn't get that out. But um, going from an A1 to a AAA uh, on, a, on a debt issuance, I mean, that, that is worth maybe a savings of about a million and a half dollars to your taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And again, this is, this, this is just to the good work of your staff and, and your board. So we look forward to having an extremely successful sale based on the fact that you've got, you've put us basically on the one yard line. Thank you. And that's a uh, remarkable, I know Mr. Barrios is hard at work right now in a press release uh, <laughs> touting our uh, fiscal stewardship and savings to the taxpayers. <laughs> Assented. <laughs> um, seeing no other comment or uh, questions from the board, do I have a motion to approve? And do I have a second? A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Appreciate cool. your hard work. Item 12.6. <laughs> that's, that's okay. We, that's what we do. It's fine. Good evening, board members, Board President mm -hmm. Hansen, um, Superintendent Bonda, and board members. We are here to talk about the classified layoffs. As you know, as part of the, the yearly budget process, um, there are lots of difficult decisions that have to be made when positions have to be cut. Just a reminder about the process that the district goes through in reaching these decisions. This, this slide and the next couple slides are probably familiar because it's the same process that Certificated goes through. There in January and February is what we call one-stop staffing. And this is a time where budget, area assistant superintendents, and human resources get together to go through and determine the staffing. We take all that data, do an analysis, and come up with what needs to be reduced. You should have new copies very soon of the Exhibit A, which has the positions that are to be reduced. You'll notice some of those positions are vacant, so it's actually not a person receiving a notice, and other positions um, are actually going to be there. So these are based on the lack of lack of funds for the most part, some of them tied to um, grant funding that comes back, and in those cases, we issue recensions. So, with that, at this late hour, we have, no, sorry, just, yeah. Um, so we actually have a slight revision, and it's coming right now for you, for you to look at. There were um, two that were on there previously that are being reduced. I will say that compared to where we were last year, we had about 60 FTEs coming forward um, to share with you that needed to be reduced. And this year, the, the, um, the versions that you are, are now getting reflect 48, including seven vacant. So these, again, are positions that are reduced due to lack of funding and or grants not yet coming through. So 
So there will be the case where when those, when those grants come through, sometimes it happens as soon as May, sometimes not till July, then we would go through and issue rescissions for those. So what you're receiving right now is that updated list. Again, very similar to the one that was shared earlier, it is minus two positions. Realize that these are difficult decisions and difficult um, uh, process to go through. And in many of the grant situations, again, we do get those back. But because it's not a guarantee that we'll get them back, we have to ensure that we're appropriately staffed. So you have the Exhibit A. So we ask that you approve Resolution, resolution 2936. We have any board comments or questions? Public comment? Mr. No Rogers? public comment. All right. Any members going once, going twice? I think we're familiar with this. So uh, I have a motion to move this from conference to action. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Do I have a second? second? I have a motion and a second to take action. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Thank you very much. Under the wire. Very good. And now we are receiving information. Thank you. Received. Uh, a motion to adjourn Ms. Rosas would be in order. Ms. Rosas calling Ms. Rosas. A motion to adjourn would be in order. I move to adjourn to close. to close session. Into closed session. Thank you. Yes, we will continue upstairs. Do I have a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Upstairs. Thank you. <laughs>